Hi everyone. So uh, I've just had a, uh, I think it's close to three hour conversation with Everything Money. We started off talking about investing and that was great. But over the conversation, we ended up talking about luxury goods. We talked about Ferraris. We talked about Patek Philippe watches. And then towards the end, we got into relationships. And I discovered that Paul, like me, has multiple therapists. And I am <laughs> friends with people who have multiple therapists. And so it, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. It went to places I never expected it to go. It's got content that I've never shared publicly before. And so I hope you enjoy it. So this is not bullshit. I'm being 100% honest with you here. Your book, I think, is absolutely necessary for everyone to read before they pick individual stocks. It is the, so in our community of investors, people say to me, Paul, what book should I read? Very first one, well, The Education of Value Investor. Well, I'm delighted. And my publisher's delighted as well. Well, um, <laughs> the reason being though, Guy, is, you know, so people always say to me, Paul, write a book. Paul, write. You know, I said, oh, like, oh, there are plenty of wonderful books out there. I don't need to explain to you what ROIC is. I don't need to explain to you yeah. what price of free cash flow is. It, it's the same. I mean, yes, yeah. there's different very. Your book talks so much about the most important part, 90% of investing, which is yeah. how do you stay in something that has fallen a lot and how do you avoid things that have risen a ton? You yeah. know, I'm programmed a different way. When I see something skyrocket, I go, I'm staying away. Mm. When I see something fall, I go, let me take a look. Yeah. Um, so when you wrote the book, was it your intention to write this kind of book or did it become, and you're smiling now, so I'm hoping there's a good answer there. <laughs> there is a good answer. Good. And I, I don't know how discursive I can be. Do, do, I'm going I'm to try this and it's great that you've invited me and I appreciate both of you of being here and giving me the time of day. Um, so I'm going to try and do it in terms of the story. And I don't know why I read the story, but so the story is that the king is standing on the balcony of his beautiful palace. And of course, he's got a daughter of marriageable age and they're there for some kind of cocktail party or something. And the balcony overlooks a river. and It's an alligator infested river. And uh, suddenly they see a man who's swimming across the river and fighting off alligators. And the king thinks, wow, that's the kind of guy I'd like to have marry my daughter, maybe give him my kingdom. So they, they kind of, he gets to the other side and he sends some guys to go meet him and he gets washed up and he joins the court on the balcony and the king says to him, uh, you know, so what you did there was incredible. You fought off eight alligators, you survived. And, um, you know, I'll offer you, what would you like? I'll offer you my kingdom and my daughter. And the guy looks around and he says, me? I just want to know who pushed me in. Yeah. <laughs> so why is that in any way an answer to your question? Because that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I did not show up in the world with this calm sort of, I'm going to write a book that op splits my guts out to the world. What happened to me is, so I know you've had Monish on this program. So I was envious of Monish because he'd written a book and I hadn't. No and kidding. So I'm, I'm like, you know, and I've gotten to a place in my life where I've realized that when you feel envy, you've got to channel that in the right way. So the right way to channel it is not to be angry at Monish, it's go and try and write go your and own do book. It. So I start trying to write my own book. And then, you know, through a series of events, I suddenly have a book contract. And I was so scared to sign the book contract because signing the book contract meant I'm going to publish this book, even if it's a bad book. So that was kind of the push that I had. Now the contract's behind me. I've got like sort of around 18 months to deliver a manuscript. And that's gonna, they know more or less it's going to be sort of something about me, my li life, universe, and investing. Mm -hmm. And this guy had lunch with Warren Buffett, so maybe he's going to write about that. And, but now I'm kind of like, what am I going to write about that is going to be meaningful for the audience, that is going to actually make a difference for them? Because we've all seen investment books that rehash the same stuff. Yeah, you said. there's so and many over. that are redundant. And so for one reason or another, I figured out that the only thing that I could really do that would be useful and meaningful, the only thing I was a real expert in was my own experience of yeah. doing this. But, but just to be clear with anybody who's a budding writer or anybody who has the wrong impression, you know, it was like the guy swimming across fighting off the alligators. This was not a happy, fun, easy experience. This was like gut-wrenching. Yeah. And I remember writing the first chapter and then thinking, and I wrote it for myself, and then wondering, am I actually going to publish this or am I going to just flush it down the toilet? I remember realizing the point at which I I so the fear of uh, publishing it was that people would read it and say, we're never going to invest with this guy. He worked for a sleaze bag shop and he was full <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and the other option was uh, uh, 
to not publish it and make the book less good because I knew it would make the book better when I realized that I cared more about writing uh, the best possible book and um, possibly having no career in finance after that. And I kind of bit that bullet. And I remember, so we talked about William Green just now. So William Green is now sitting down with me to edit that chapter. And he, so he reads that chapter. And he looks at me and says, you did that stuff, guys? <laughs> I can't believe I invested with you. So that's how it came out. It didn't come out sort of like with a sense of grace and ease. It yeah. came out out of fear of not being able to deliver something that was worthwhile for the audience. Hmm. And um, yeah, so. So you're, you're saying William Green looked and said sleaze, but like DH, your shift, I was telling Paul yesterday, you went from polar opposites. You went from somebody who came to Wall Street, wanted to be a hot shot fund manager, everybody to know your name, yeah. to a guy who now lives in Switzerland that secludes himself and is in the world of boring value investing. That is a crazy switch. How did that take place? So it's funny. So we were walking here, and for the viewer, we're in Manhattan right now. And um, many things came together for me to, to make me realize that I didn't want to stay in New York City. And again, an emotion for me that has been really instructive is this, this sort of like emotion of envy. And mm -hmm. You know, I fundamentally, I, I think I've heard Warren and Charlie say that they joke and say that envy is of, of the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least the other ones are enjoyable, I mean, <laughs> gluttony and you yeah. know, envy is not even enjoyable. But in a certain sense, I don't think that envy is necessarily a sin. It's a, it's a clue to something else that's going on. So here in New York City, I remember thinking a lot about Bill Ackman yep. and knowing that Bill Ackman paid the extra money to have his car parked on the floor just as you go into the garage, so that when he went in, he could just pick up the car and go. Mm -hmm. Whereas my car was like three floors down and I'd have to call them and wait, wait 20 minutes yeah. because I didn't want to pay the extra X thousand or hundred dollars a month for it. So um, I, that was just gnawing at me. And, you know, I would go to Omaha every year and I saw that you, everybody can live a happy life in Omaha. But there were other things that came together as well. I don't think I'd do well in a loud environment. And uh, you get used to New York and the streets are loud, but you go inside. But at the end of the day, it's a loud environment. And the only place that I had to appreciate nature was Central Park a little bit and maybe Riverside Park. And then the whole school system here as a whole. So I, a bunch of things came yeah. together for me. And then but another thing, and maybe this is perhaps helpful. Um, so in, in the search for the optimum, you know, we can do small steps and see if we get better. So, you know, move a couple of blocks here or there, yeah. move a bit in one, within one's profession. And then the younger you are, the better it is to make huge moves to see if they work out. So no doubt. But, but so, so going from New York to Zurich was a huge move. It was yeah. a fundamental change. But even then, actually, we did it in steps. So we went, the, the summer of 2008, we went for two weeks as okay. a family. And it wasn't like we're going to move here. It was just let's try this out, see what it's like. And I just remember, uh, so Zurich uh, downtown has a lot of pedestrian areas. I remember seeing our children just run with abandon down the street. You know, the, the safe distance in New York City when you have a kid who's five or six years old, <laughs> it's like about 100 meters, and then you start getting a little bit antsy about yeah. where they are and what might happen. They might run into the street. They right. might, and, uh, and just that sense of relaxation to know that they could run away from us for as far as they liked and they were safe. And, and I saw how the relationship was with my wife and with my children. And so I have this theory, or, or the way I like to describe it is, is God smiling at you? You know, we get, I think when we, we make a move in a different direction, we get clues as to whether it's the right thing or not, because things show up mm -hmm. that are positive and sort of say, yeah, I think I did make the right decision here. And there were many things that showed up for me that showed that I made the right decision. I don't know if I've answered your question. But. No, you did. I mean, it was uh, the shift. To, like to me, that's the biggest thing about you that I, my biggest takeaway about your personality is somebody that went from, I'm going to do this to the polar opposite side of the spectrum. You know, we, we talk about that. You know, I talk about that a lot with, um, we're here in New York City and I, and I look at my fiance and I look at her and say, how do people live in a city making under $5 million a year? And I, I look at that and, you know, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. Everybody's like, oh, Cleveland. I, I love living in Cleveland. And for me, you know, we, um, I, 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 my, per, you know, my, my, my path in life, you know, like you said, people can change a lot over time. When I left college, I remember thinking to myself, I, I need to live in New York City 
or Chicago or I'm a failure. And then I live in Ohio. And I literally think to myself, thank God I didn't live in New York City or Chicago. And guess what? I'm sure my life would have been great no matter where I ended up being because I do think it's a positivity thing. And I think I would have ended up back in Ohio anyhow. But I think to get back to the book real quick, I, I look at your book and it's, it's interesting that the parallels I see to what's going on right now, the memory part was you said, you said in the book, you know, here's 2008, things are crashing. And all these people who said they were value investors are now bailing. And the reason I find that interesting is because here's what I find interesting about today. I tell people, you know, you know, uh, John Hussman, uh, it's not ringing a bell. So John Hussman, he writes, you know, he's a, um, he's a value guy, but he's been absolutely like butchered by people, but he has a great analogy and we're sitting here next to a fireplace, a former fireplace. That's what he says is, listen, everybody wants to pick what's going to be a thing that's going to cause the crash. That's really ridiculous. But what he says is, if there's a room filled with gasoline and and there's a a fireplace in the corner, I don't know what spark is going to cause the explosion. All I know is there will be a spark that causes the explosion. And it's interesting because the reason that it makes, the reason I'm bringing that up is when you talk about the people, there's always a reason why, you know, the stock is down 50%, but now the reason I don't want to own it is this. And they're, they're scrambling. So when you wrote that in that book, I remember thinking to myself, this is incredible. I remember I always have stories about this. And when I, when I thought about it, when, when you first saw that, because yeah. when I first saw that, with the, I always tell the story on the channel. When I first saw that, I remember thinking to myself, these people are stupid. Now I look at it going, these people are human. So when you first saw that, what did you think? You mean the, sort of the price crashes of two? Yeah, and then you saw all the people who said, no, we're value players, we're value buyers. And they didn't bail. They, they actually ended up bailing before they ended up, when the market was doing what, what you wanted them to do, what you wanted the market to do. You want cheaper prices. I remember you. Um, I wanted cheaper prices, but I was pretty fully invested. <laughs> you, were, yeah. I was, you, were, you were down 46% in change, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was no fun for me. And I, yeah. and, uh, I had one company that was, was, um, was down uh, about 90%. So, I'd, so I'd, I'd bought... Uh, Did you hang with it? Yes. So, so in this case, the company was, is called, was called Crosstex. And it, it, I'd owned it from like around $14 or $15 a share to mm-hmm. around $20, 21 22 And it drops to three. Wow. And, um, but the family that controls it are the right kind of people and mm. it works all its way all the way back to around 27 28 at which point the company is sold yeah and so um i ended up making money but over a seven or eight year period and it was a tough a tough way through um, <laughs> yeah god i think that what i found shocking in 2000 so what i remember speaking to some of my investors and saying look people haven't stopped buying food uh all of the companies that we own, or the vast majority of them, making things that people want and need on a daily basis, no matter what happens on the planet. And so, no, I'm not selling any of these things. And yeah, they're down a lot, but that's okay. What really amazed me was people who just went to cash yeah. in their whole portfolio. And they kind of said, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to own stocks for a while. And, and people who considered themselves to be value investors. I remember you put an example in there. You had a friend that went to cash and you said, are you kidding me? And it was very hard for me because I was scared. I mean, maybe I shouldn't have been in if the be- best investor version of myself would not have been scared, but I was scared. It's a, I, I remember walking around, uh, you know, and so I've set myself up as a guy that people should trust mm-hmm. and I'm there to protect their interests. And now those people, whatever number they had invested with me, it's worth approximately half. Yeah. And so that was, I, I remember walking around feel, feeling numb. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I believe that people like Warren Buffett, they're not emotionally affected. In a certain way, I was absolutely emotionally affected. It's just no fun. I mean, I can't pretend that I had, um, I was able to be neutral about that. I mean, mm-hmm. in a certain way, if something had forced me to sell a portfolio, and raise cash for some reason or other, then I would have been able to raise half the cash. And some way in my mind, the net worth of myself and all of my investors had gone down by 50%. But what I knew, and I trained myself, and I I was sufficiently aware that I was not going to sell a damn thing. You know, I'm not going to... Although I did actually switch, just on a very minor way, I switched the portfolio around a little bit. Um, But the people who just go to straight cash, and you're like, why? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That was that was kind of shocking to me, and 
upsetting to me because it made it harder for me not to do that because it has an Im- what other people do around you has an impact. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that that was, uh, how long was it? It was about 15 years into my career, maybe 12 years into my career. And I think that if the same thing were to happen now, and it could, I, I, would, I would live with it quite a bit easier. I was going to say, like. that was a question, but would it be easier second time around just because you kind of know and when when that was happening how because we get the question a lot of yeah. how do you deal with emotion that's the biggest thing because we're pretty mm-hmm. calm guys when it comes to the market yeah. and how did you your first time around losing almost 50 percent? how did you kind of adopt I, that type of mentality and i think that what's hard is so like if you own i mean i love using nestle as an example because they make all these food products that everybody uses and they make sure people are going to continue using but in the crosstex example I was enamored with the business model. This was an MLP structure with uh, so, so a company that issues limited partner units to fund the acquisition of, in this case, oil and gas pipelines. Mm-hmm. And uh, then there was I, I owned the kind of the partner that did that, and I thought this was a great business structure, and it was. It was very very profitable on the way up, but if suddenly, as what happened to them, they weren't able to issue uh, this um, these. Uh, interest paying partnership units, the kind of the business model. Um, so, so the, 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 there will, there would be no growth left. And suddenly what looked like an inexpensive valuation actually was quite expensive. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then a whole bunch of people didn't want to own the units anymore, which made it much more expensive for them to issue units and a whole bunch of assets that they could have acquired. They no longer could acquire. And so in the price decline, that's when I learn all these things. And I say, wow, I thought this thing was such a good business model, but it has some hidden weaknesses yeah. or weaknesses that were hidden to me that are suddenly blindingly obvious to me and every single other person in the market. And I wish I'd understood this a year Before, ago and I yeah. you know now. So then, then you're like, oh my God, why do I own this? Why, why did I buy this? Yeah. And so, so that is really, really hard. And that's, that's where, so um, one of the things to say to oneself, and I think that... Uh, one of the reasons why you are, um, and I really appreciate that you tuned into the book because it's about learning how to speak to yourself in the right way. What is my inner voice? What am I telling myself? Yeah. Uh, and 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 to, and one of the things that one wants to tell oneself is a, we're going to have adversity no matter what. Mm-hmm. And so to say when I when a thing like so it's easy with a thing like Nestle, but if it's a cross tax. To, to, instead of saying, because what the voice that, that flares up is, you flaming idiot, any fool could have seen this. Look at all the pundits saying that any fool could have seen this. And you owned it, and now you're an idiot. And I remember in 2008, the worst feeling for me was that I'd set myself up in front of investors to say, you can trust me, I'm smart, I know what I'm doing. There I was down 50% or 46%. So how could I do that? I felt shame, mm-hmm. actually. Yeah. and. Uh, so whether it's an individual stock or the whole portfolio, to become aware of one's inner voice and the inner voice ought to be saying, hey, you're only human, as was the point, the point that you made. Um, you know, your job is to learn. And yeah, it's far better to learn from other people's mistakes. But now you have to, you have to learn from your own mistake and use this adversity to learn what you need to learn. Um, uh, it would be a double tragedy if you both lost money and you didn't learn the lesson. So I think people want to go into denial. They want to pretend they didn't own it. They want to shut it down. They want to get rid of the pain. But if you can use the pain, you can really, really become a better investor. So the lessons of uh, Crosstex are seared into me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Charlie Munger says, rub your nose and your mistakes. He's kind of saying, don't run away from them. Um, Learn from them. But but it's it's and, and I think that one of the things that I learn from that adversity and other periods of adversity is, you know, even though they're not rational or true, have certain beliefs. So one of the non-rational, untrue beliefs that I have is that God is watching me. And if I don't buy the stock, it'll go up. But if I buy the stock, it will go down a lot. So do I still want to own it? And am I willing to own it? And keep being aware that that may be the outcome and might and and if you live with that but i think that when you're when you're new into the game of investing it's a natural thing to become overconfident so you end up you know i ended up owning too much of cross tax it's not the only thing that i own too much of always in hindsight yeah of course yeah because greed's taking you over when you're buying 
and just say that is part of the game. Everybody's done that. Everybody's been there. And hopefully it doesn't. So there are some people who went into such extremes. Series, yeah. I know somebody who owned one stock, I think levered. And he was convinced this thing was going to go up five times and it was going to turn him into a billionaire. Instead, it went down by whatever it was. And um, he was out of business basis. You, you never, ever want to do something that puts you out of business. The Crosstex, it turned out not to be such a big mistake. I didn't actually lose money on right. it. There have been other things where I've lost money and you've just got to know that you're going to have those things. And early in your career, you need to either talk to somebody or listen to this podcast and hear me saying it. But it's going to happen. There's going to be something where you go, I'm such an idiot. I've blotted my copybook. I shouldn't have done it. And now I'm a fool and I'll be a fool for the rest of my life. And my answer to that person is, okay, you feel like a fool. Now use this. Yeah. Don't be a double fool and not learn from it. Keep a diary. Write it down. Learn every lesson you can because if you don't learn the lessons this time, God will send you the same thing again and you'll have to learn the lessons. The Reincarnation, time, so. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I am um, not, not even reincarnation. You'll send it to you in one year's time. No, I know. <laughs> it's kind of like the idea of reincarnation, though. You know, we're always learning our lessons. Um, I, you know, there's very few books that really I sat there, and and the reason being is the emotional part of investing. I, you know, my friends joke with me and say they call me contrarian, Paul. Oh, Paul only disagrees because he's contrarian, and it's fine. I remember when I was a kid, and my father scolding me about something. He said, "You're so argumentative." And I said, yeah, but isn't that a good thing? And he said, it can be. Uh, but I didn't realize, like, now looking at it, I sit there and say, I, I really truly enjoy when someone tells me I'm wrong. Because I think to myself, I look at, oh, so you don't know much. Of, we, I own a lot of real estate. Yeah. I have businesses. I have real estate. I have stocks. I'm very fortunate for one thing. I have no clients. It's my dad, my yeah. brother, and myself. Wow. We have a small family office. Yeah. I run, so I don't have anybody to feel bad for. I don't have anybody. So I have that big luxury in life from an investing standpoint where if I invested, if I had people's monies in my hands, I'd be like, what am I doing here? I, I just look at this thinking, you know, when you, you, know, you talk about 18, well, how many stocks do you have right now? 18? About 18, yeah. And you said that when you had cross text, you had too much in there. I actually go against the typical value investor thing of I like diversification because I look at it saying, I can find 30 or 30 stocks that have certain criteria. I'm willing to make a bet on it. The difference is I want to let my runners run. Yeah. I'm okay with that. What do you yeah. think about that as opposed to, I'm not trying to jump in and out of stocks. I'd rather buy good companies at good price, great price. I believe you can buy a great company at a great price and just let it run. And over time, your portfolio will adjust to the lack of diversification, if that makes sense. because so, so one way of looking at that is that Chris, I love Chris Mayer's book. Uh, oh, yeah. 101, 100, 100 100 100 100 great book. Hunter Baggers. And, and I think that in that book, he talks about uh, the coffee can portfolio. Yep. Love the coffee can portfolio. Yeah, and, and actually, I would tell you that I, I do We interviewed that. him, by the way. Yeah, he's a, you know, I, 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 it, it's really, the more success you get in life, the more we all realize how dumb we are. Because the more successful you become, the more you come across smart people. Yeah. You know, And then you live in a world where everybody's smarter than you. And it's just really tough. So and the other thing is, the smart people you meet, you're like, they're just as stupid as I am. <laughs> no, I think they're all smarter than I am, believe me. No, no, I mean, the sense that they, they still make stupid mistakes oh, that see. we all do. They're still human. Yeah, yeah they, well, it's a great point. It's a great point. So look at that smart guy. Look at the mistakes that he's made. Yeah. So well, you think that you're not going to get by without making yeah, those yeah. mistakes. Of course, you're going to do the same thing. <laughs> but uh, so I would tell you that I try to run my portfolio in the same way. So, so um, there are positions that balloon to 25% of the portfolio, but they started at 5%. Mm -hmm. And so I will not put, and I've done in the past, I mean, this one big bankruptcy in my portfolio, I, it was, um, it, well, it was 10% of the portfolio when it went bankrupt. So it was a very, very painful episode. I lost 10% of my capital effectively. But I will, I will put 5% of the value of the portfolio at any particular time into one thing. And then it run for a very, very long time. And, um, and so it can work really well and it can work less well. So if we've correctly, successfully selected long-term compounders, that's awesome. You know, if we find the Walmarts and the Costcos early on in their life cycle. But if you, if you find the one that actually didn't turn out to be a compounder, and I've experienced buying something and it goes up four or five times and then it's down by half, by 50%. And it's not terrible. 
but and, and I've resolutely not traded it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I asked myself, maybe I should have sold some when it was getting when the valuation was getting beyond itself. Now I'll only buy things, well, I try to only buy things that have a kind of like an appreciation curve over time. And then there's this question of well, how far above the, the, the intrinsic value appreciation curve does it have to get before I decide to lighten up? You know? So what is it? So what is it? <laughs> for you, you. When do you sell? For you. For, because cause for me, I, I worry about that all the time when yeah. I sit there. Professor Aswath, um, he says, Damn, Yeah, Damn, yeah Damn, what yeah. he said the other day, which I don't agree with, but he said, if I have a 40% tax rate, if the valuation is 40% above my intrinsic value, I will sell. I think that's a nice, neat little. Yes, it's cute. By the way, I like the idea that it's a rule. But the thing is, he didn't do it with NVIDIA recently. He sold half his position of NVIDIA according to his valuation. Because of FOMO. He, 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 said, he said he kept ha- he sold half because of the tax rate rule, but then he kept half because he was like, I fear that it might go up and I miss out on it. Yeah, and so, so there's, him comfortable. there's such powerful irrationality. Yeah. And to your point, if Damaradan is, is worried about his own irrationality, exactly. then... Exactly, exactly. Um, and I look at Microsoft. I bought Microsoft starting at like 17, 18, up to 22. It went to 60, and I said, this thing is not even worth 40. I sold it. Yeah, and then it doubled again. No, it, it's at 380 now. You know what I mean? I look <laughs> well, at the I biggest, position. I, 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 like I look at that saying, okay, it's been overvalued since I sold it. Yeah. But the thing I learned. So that the question to you is, when do you sell? So you know, and to give you an example, there is there is this uh, company, Indian Energy Exchange, where I put four percent of the portfolio in it, went up four and a half times or so. So it's now twenty percent of the portfolio, and then it goes down by fifty percent. And uh, and and I didn't take any money off the table. And then I have Ferrari, where um, it was spun out to me from Fiat. And um, I did, took half off the table. It was in the middle of the COVID crisis. Yeah. And I deeply regret right. taking half off the table. So which is the right thing? And it's always easy in retrospect. And I haven't figured out what my answer to that is. Good. I, th- I think that <laughs> D- Damaradan has, a, has, from his behavior, has a great point, which is, and, and here's, I think, what is key to it is actually the standard by which we should measure ourselves is, is not what is rational, but how do I best manage my own psychology? Mm-hmm. And I think that to take half off the table, and there's a famous story of in the, in, William Green writes about Nick Sleep, that he took half of, uh, I don't know if it was Nick or his partner, Zach, took half of their Amazon position off the table in the same way. And so I, I don't think there's anything, anything wrong with what I did with Ferrari, especially from the perspective of the second one, India Energy Exchange. Um, and so I think that what the answer I think I would want to give, which I'm sure is the right for me mm-hmm. and people who want to think like me is... And that's a key what, thing, what yeah, you just said. Do, it's for me. Yeah. How do I manage my psychology in the best possible way? Yep. And, um, and there's another sort of aspect to this, which nobody goes into, Obviously, what's right for me might not be right for somebody else because I, what I've experienced is as, as my perception of my own net worth has ratcheted up, mm-hmm. feelings of loss from that level of net worth are far more painful. And so rather than say, well, actually, I'm at 7 or 8x the net worth that I had 20 years ago, so why am I concerned about a 20% drawdown? Yeah. Uh, but somehow my, my perception of net worth ratchets up. It also depends on what we do with our lifestyle. Because lifestyle ratchets up if you have any success. <laughs> but, but some people... You're telling are, me. <laughs> yeah. Some people are successful in not ratcheting their lifestyle. Who? <laughs> Even Warren Buffett's done it. I don't want to hear it. Even Warren Buffett's ratcheted up his lifestyle since uh, with his net worth. Um, you know, far less than maybe other people would have. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so that can affect our psychology of whether, whether we feel comfortable taking half off the table or not. It's tough choices, you know? But who, I mean, I know this is a, a cop out. It's like, who said this was supposed to be easy? But I think the perspective that I think that I'm really excited because I know that you've tapped into it is stop trying to find the answer in textbooks. Yeah. Stop trying to look to what other people did. Look Their balance sheet is not your balance sheet. Yeah. You know, try, what is the right thing for me to do? as I progress through time and how do I manage my psychology in the best possible way? So So, so, literally sitting in that position right now with my Apple. Yeah. So his basis on Apple is like 17 $17, bucks. And it's one, you know, he talked about it and we've sat there and said, so, you know, to, to go back on that one, it's, it's, you know, I, I think about my, the way I've gone. And again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm my, my evolution of value investing has changed over time from, from situations. The bottom line is the way I look at it now is, 
I would like to be the guy who sits there and says, if I have no cash available and I have something that I really want to buy, then I will start selling my overvalued positions. But if I'm not even fully vested yet, I look at it going, why take money off the table? Let's think, like I look at Costco. I love Charlie Munger. No. But I, the number of people on Twitter who talk about how much they love Costco, I'm like, guys, Costco is not worth $600 a share. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't care how much yeah. Munger loves it. It is not worth $600. This is a slow growth, wonderful business. Yeah. But it is the prime example of people hearing a guy like Charlie Munger say, I'm never selling Costco for the rest of my life. Newsflash, he's 100 in 70 days. So his idea of, so I look at that saying, to me, that's where I look at it going, if I don't have a need for the money to buy something else, why do it? Yeah. That's where I thought by myself, when you talk about like, what's right for you, for myself, I'm like, that seems the right, if I have cash laying around, but I can buy something else I want, why would I need to sell something that I, by the way, within a certain reason, but what reason is that, you know, Costco's at six hundred dollars or at five hundred? When it was even at four hundred and fifty, I'm like, how do you justify Costco at four fifty? I don't know. And so here's another uh, way of looking at it, a framework, I guess, that I really love is so there's some talk I believe. Don't ask me to reference it directly, where it's Ch Charlie and Warren, and they're saying something like, if you're in a mid-sized town in the Midwest, and so that we need to go back to the days when people actually went to offices and people actually mm -hmm. bought. If you own the leading shopping mall, if you own the leading office building, the leading gas station, and the leading McDonald's franchise, you know, it doesn't. Why would you ever want to sell sell those things? You're going to do really, really well, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what price people offer you to to take them off your hands. And another example of that is we rent our home in Zurich and our children have grown up in that home. We love that home and we've, we would love to buy it. And the last and only conversation I had with the owner who's friends with us, we see them socially, we hang out together and, um, and he's actually now got young children. He inherited the house with his sister from his parents and we're like, are you not going to want to move in here? And, and he's like, no, we've decided that we're just going to leave you there. But when I've tried to buy it from him, I, I got to, well, you know, we could, and I start with the B. He's like, no, not happening. <laughs> you don't even know what price would offer. He says, yeah, I don't, not interested. I mean, they don't own the house debt free. Yeah. They don't have any mortgage on it. They, it's like, what am I going to do with the money? I don't need the money. What's the point? The framework is stop thinking in terms of how am I going to earn the highest return and say, I want to own some really incredible assets. And once I own those assets, I'm never going to give them up. And in a certain sense, you know, once you've locked into shares of Ferrari, you know, and 14,000 cars sold, I think, last year around that number, mm -hmm. like, you know, the world could easily absorb 50,000 Ferrari cars. Absolutely. And so, like, just have that forever, you know? Yeah. And, and there's a beautiful thing, if you can do that, of just saying, you know, and at some point, it's like, who cares how rich I become? I own this incredible asset, or I'm a part owner of this incredible asset. It's not, not about how many zeros there are after yeah. my name. And somehow I think that Warren Buffett did that when he closed down his partnerships. And he actually, it, it set him up to become even more successful. So there's a way in which you focus on life in a different way, allows you to become more successful. I actually spend quite a bit of time educating my investors in that regard. And there's a, something that happens that gives, so yes, I do have outside investors, but those who've been me for five, six, seven years or more, they already have a lot of appreciation in the portfolio, so they feel differently about somebody who's recently invested. Right. It's not as good as having it all be your own money, but there's a benefit to having those people for a long time. But the other side of it is that I have a very unbalanced portfolio because some things have gone out four or five times, some things haven't. So even though I put in 5% at a time, uh, some positions have ballooned and some things haven't. So I need to let the investors know they're buying into a kind of an unbalanced portfolio, if you like. So no, that's but, a valid point. But but I think that you know, in in your case, all your own money, family business, family office. So I'm I'm going in a, in a week or two's time. I'm going to the Exor meeting. Exor is the family office publicly traded of John Alcan, who uh, uh, is running the Agnelli family fortune, and he's the chairman of. I think he's still the chairman of Stellantis, which is what mm. Fiat merged, merged into. He's the chairman of Ferrari. They own Juventus Soccer. And, um, you know, what they put up on their slides is we build businesses, you know. And we know Berkshire Hathaway talks about, you know, 
the, the Museum of Modern Art. Well, this is the museum of the world's best businesses. He wants Berkshire to be a, a, sort of a bunch of museum pieces. And so a goal for you and your family, if I may be so bold, is we're going to own some incredible businesses, and then we're going to own them forever. But we've got to buy them at the right price. Yeah, of oh, course. Oh, you hesitated. Yeah. Why did you hesitate there? Because it's hard. I know. And, and, and you know, I was... I was at a, an amazing investment conference called Tulipomania in, um, in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm presenting this idea, and I'm like, did I ever pay for this? <laughs> for which one? <laughs> so this is a, um, it's this India Energy Exchange. It's a, um, it's a monopoly. And uh, so, so, you know, I, my fund owns like almost uh, 2% of the company. And this company is the, dominant energy exchange for the whole of India. So is Monish involved in this as well? I he he was, but I, I don't think he is anymore. Okay. And um how much do you want to pay to own the the dominant electricity exchange in India? I mean the, you know if fast if, growing economy, so, yeah. so just fast you know economy. just for fun, uh the the intensity per capita consumption of energy in India is one third what it would be in Western Europe or the US. Mm-hmm. And this company has Right now, their, their penetration of the electricity market is 10%, but in a developed market like Europe, it's 80%. So you take 8 times 3. And 24x you got, potential. Yeah, easily. And, uh, and that's not including ancillary businesses, other fees, other ways. So you're like, like my God, I, you know, I, I'm ha- and it's kind of like, you know, side of the box, it's kind of like a Kathy Wood mm-hmm. analysis where you're saying, well, how much am I willing to pay up to own a piece of that? Uh, but then the question arises, and this is only after I invested in it, or it's like, well, the regulator doesn't like seeing very obvious monopolies. And this is a very obvious, mon- I shouldn't call it monopoly. It's just a winner takes most business, call it that. Yeah. And so what, what sticks might they put in the wheels and what ways and what might they try and make it less profitable or destroy the monopoly? Or, uh, so there are things that come from outside the business. Mm-hmm. That, but but um, so, and, and a, a really incredible business, Kathy Wood is not wrong, that the really incredible businesses you're never going to get them cheap. I mean, there are businesses, a whole bunch of businesses in the financial services space, like Morningstar is one, and um, MSGI is another, and you've got the credit rating agencies. You're never going to get them for a cheap price. So the question Why is... Why is that? You really think so? I'd look at Apple just seven, eight years ago, which is an incredible business, was selling for nine times. Look at Microsoft 10 years ago, selling for nine times, 10 times. And I look at that thinking... Yes, they're not the same companies as today, but Apple was still selling a crap ton of iPhones. But I remember somebody saying to me, Paul, from a value perspective, is Apple, I'm like, it's an incredible value. But my yeah. concern was, what if somebody comes out with a better phone? They yeah. weren't as immersed. So you might sit there and say, yeah, Paul, it wasn't ecosystem. as great of a business. Yeah. I truly believe, and this is me, Guy, yeah. and you're, you're going to probably disagree with me. I truly believe that the incredible businesses need the market shift for you to get the great prices. But those will still happen. Like Warren and Charlie always say, few times in your life when you find an amazing opportunity at an amazing price that's so obvious, you got to go, you got to put a big bet on there. And I do believe that Microsoft, Apple, Google, all these incredible companies yeah. will sell for an incredible price, but we need an 08, a 2000, yeah. uh, a 70s. We need, we need something like that to happen where people just say the death of equity is as Barron's yeah. wrote in 1982. I truly, again, you might sit there and say, well, Paul, you can't make a bet every 20 years. I'm not saying only wait your Actually, money. in the way you're set up, you can. <laughs> well, the way I'm set yeah. up, yes, yeah. correct. But I also have businesses, real estate, other yeah. ways of making money. But, that, but you, by the way, so, so for somebody who doesn't have that, maybe the answer is not to get down on yourself for not making the right timing, timing questions on waiting for an 08 or something like that. And to look at you and say, well, maybe I need to get into, maybe I need a balance of businesses or yeah. balance of investment types in my life to allow me that mental stability. And I can tell you that, you know, actually there's learning for me in talking to you because I, because I have less balance than I could have actually by having that second and third leg to the stool, which you have so that you can invest better in equities. You know? Yeah. So, and that's, and that's something that my brother and I, we discuss at length. And my brother's young too. I'm 42, he's 34. And we discuss at length that, um, you know, we have so many, you know, when people come to us and pitch us, we say, listen, we've got businesses, we've got real estate, we've got equities. I don't need to invest in anybody else. Like, yeah. guy, you could give me the, if, if, if Monish and Warren Buffett said, Paul, give your money to Guy Spear right now, I'd say, 
I don't need to. I've got not, so many options. You know what I mean? It's not just that you don't need to. It's that, you know, I have enough relationships in my life. I don't want another person to follow. I don't want another person's letters to read and to wonder how, what he's up to and mm-hmm. whether I'm still okay with it. There's a limit to one's of course. Uh, bandwidth. But, but you have a diversity of types of business in there. And so, you know, when, when equities are running and not worth doing something, you've got other places where you can look, which is wonderful. Yeah, and my, my biggest mistake has been... Um, not letting the runner, the winners run, just sitting there and worrying too much about valuation. And yeah. it, it, that, the, the interesting part is value investors. I've shifted from the early Ben Graham to the Philip Fisher method of saying, yes. listen, let's buy high quality businesses at reasonable yes. prices and let them compound, let them buy back shares when things are cheap. I, I don't know. It, it, it's, this is the battle that I go internally saying, I love the tin can idea, the mm-hmm. coffee can. Okay, stick them away. You know, you're going to sit there and do great. But like you said, the, the Paul of 15 years ago, how do I maximize return? Mm-hmm. The Paul of today is, I've got more than I need. Uh-huh. How do I sleep well at night? How do I enjoy things? How yeah. do I make a reasonable rate of return that, in things that I understand and enjoy? Go ahead, Mo, and then I'll you, say You guys are talking well. a lot about, basically you're talking about a lot about the inner scorecard. Yeah. You had a big shift in your inner scorecard where you were, I mean, you... I went as far as hiring Chantel, who you said today, Chantel, she brought me here to make sure I get here today. And like, but what did you do to, what was the moment where you were like, I need to shift things around. I need to figure out what exactly is the problem. How can I be better? Like you said, you have ADD. Yeah. You, you needed somebody to manage your life, basically. I mean, um, so I think that one thing about in a scorecard and what we were just talking about, by the mm-hmm. way, there's something that was just coming up to me before I get to that, which is so much, well, it's just a fun thing, you know, rich man died. Do you know how much money he left behind? All of it, you know? Yeah. I'm constrained by time, not money, in, in the vast majority of things that I want to do. But in terms of arranging ones in a scorecard, I think that there's a risk that, or a trap that I've certainly fallen into where one thinks that it's just about the inter- we play mind games with ourselves so we get down on ourselves get into a sort of a spiral of you're not doing this you're not succeeding at this you're not you're not mm-hmm. you're not playing the inner scorecard and this idea and 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 you the way you set up reminds me of it is the way for example we get set up for a better inner scorecard and think more about how we're making ourselves happy than than what we need to show to the world is, for example, by moving to Zurich, yeah. is, for example, by owning a bunch of real estate because it makes us happy and gives us a balance when this side thing isn't going well or yeah. there's no opportunities there, there's somewhere else. So I think that what, what I learn now about, for example, just taking the um, how do I live my life by a better inner scorecard is not to keep repeating a mantra, you need to have a better inner scorecard, how do I actually set myself up in do a way it. that I'm genuinely satisfied yeah. with what I have around me? So, are you generally satisfied? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I actually got to a different place, okay. which is also no good, where I was have been so satisfied that I don't, I'm not driving myself to want something. Why is so, that not good though? Uh, because I'm not. So here's an example. Uh, as you, as you could tell from. I I think that I could potentially write another book or write on some interesting topics. Mm-hmm. But my experience of writing is that it's an extraordinarily painful experience. It's not easy for me to write. And and I think that what what comes out is sometimes good. But um so do I want to live what do I want to be miserable while I'm writing and have produced something really, really good, or do I just want to be content? So I've been doing the content thing. Mm-hmm. But then I look back and I say, wow, you could have written some things and you didn't because you wanted to be content. So what if, what, what is, do you want to live a, what if living a meaningful life is an uncomfortable life and living a comfortable life is not, a, is not as meaningful as it could be? What have we put in, been put on the planet to do? I'm not sure if contentedness ought to be my goal at least. But I, you know, that's, and I, I, I'm not sure about that. I've been living a very contented life in Zurich for the last decade. So know? can I give you my personal experience of this? Yeah, I'll give you my oh, no, go, no yeah. you go first. I, I told this to Monish, and I tell this to a lot of people. I talk about the channel a lot. The idea 15 or 20 years ago of me not being the richest person in the world someday was devastating. The idea... <laughs> How, so you're laughing because how ridiculous that is. <laughs> What's that? The idea no, of not... because no, I'm right with you, man. That's where I was 25 years ago. And yeah. now, 
the idea of being the richest person in the world is the most morbidly fearful thing. I go, but you know what's happened since then? My desire for getting better has not decreased. My de- I still have ambitions. I still have this channel. You know, Tim's sitting here. He's heard my goals in the channel. It, to me, it's become a shift from what the the goal or the the the, the mean the, the ends is important to now it's the process and the, and the means of which I get there that's important. And for me, it's the journey, not the destination. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So to me, it's I stopped picking teeth and track of my net worth two or three years ago. <laughs> I I stopped doing that about. 10 years ago. So. Good. And that, so how old are you now? I'm now 57. So okay. Like around 47. Yeah. So I stopped I, keeping track of my, my, my net worth because I didn't want to start talking about keeping track of what, not the scorecard, but what, what keeps us satisfied. I found myself saying, oh, my net worth didn't go up this much this year. I did a bad job. I have to be more aggressive. And I thought to myself, no, Paul, your job is to allocate capital in the best way available to you at that time. Yeah. If that means 90 day treasuries, that means 90 day yeah. treasuries. If that means going all, that's where, I, so I shift these things, but I'm going to tell you right now, I will, I, I don't feel like it's taken away from my, it's just changed how I viewed success. Now I view success on a day-to-day basis in terms of that contentness. I consider myself successful when I'm content. I tell my fiance, so my fiance is your age and so she has different life experiences than I have. Yeah. And one of the things we always discuss is the fact that um, I look at, when I'm envious of something, I look at her and say, why the fuck am I jealous of that person? And she'll say, okay, so why are you jealous of them? Like, I, I don't know. We talk about it. Yeah. And I don't use it for the same things. Like you sit there and say, I'm jealous that Monash wrote a book. So I wrote a book. I'm more concerned about why am I even jealous of Monash writing a book when for whatever reason, you know, I, I sit there and say to me, it, it's now it's a, I don't know how to d- describe it. It's just my journey has become all about the journey and being satisfied with where I am today. But I do see in other things we do, my goals and dreams and aspirations of, look at this YouTube channel. This YouTube channel is, we don't need the money, but I do it. I still have the desire to have millions of subscribers and have millions of people on our software because I just want to build a good business. But if somebody said to me today, Paul, you're going to have 100 million subscribers of your, um, of your channel, 10 million in your software, but it's not going to be the best, or you'll have 5 million subscribers of the channel, 100,000 subscribers of the software, but it'll change people's lives. The Paul well, now yeah. would rather have that one. Yeah. The Paul 15 years ago would have had the, would have taken the first one. Wanted well, to be bigger and better. Yeah. Well, no, just bigger. Just bigger. <laughs> I'd rather been bigger, bigger and worse bigger than, than smaller than, yeah. like I'd rather now I want to be Ferrari. I want to sell 13,585 cars yeah. this year, yeah. but they're the best fucking cars you could ever imagine. Yeah. I don't want to be Chevy. That's my whole point. Yeah. No, it's a great point. You, so I, so I preface this with saying, I want you to write another book. So <laughs> that's where I'm going here. But in the book, yeah. in the book, and it, I guess it depends on what your goals are. Like, I do feel like you wrote this book for people to, I mean, it changed lives for yeah. sure. The yeah. perspective of things. And um, Warren Buffett and Monish say that give now versus waiting till the end of your life to give. Yeah. That's kind of what it is with the book. No offense you'd, to Warren Buffett. And, 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 you know, I think there's a lot. Listen, I love Warren Buffett. Because you have a lot to say. <laughs> God. I love Warren Buffett. Talk to my, talk to my children. They think I've got nothing to say. <laughs> now, listen, talk to, our, talk to our family members. They think uh, we're yeah, exactly. Shut up, Shut up Dad. My dad's like, are you done it. talking? But, you know, look at – listen, Warren Buffett, I, I love him. But, you know, you read Snowball. You read about Munger. They talk about, oh, we were never interested in being rich fast. Yes, you were. <laughs> you guys fucking say it in your book. Shut up. You know, and I look at that saying, it's just like me now. I tell all the high school kids, do what's going to make you happy. Well, yeah, because I have more money than I need. It's easy for me to say that. They have $100 billion. It's easy for them to say that. When I sit there and say, like, when you look at Warren Buffett, how he lived his life early, it's not the Warren Buffett of today. You know, oh, so what this brings up for me is, and, and it was kind of an aha moment for me at the famous charity lunch that I had, when I realized that, so, so Warren's just not interested in a whole bunch of things, yeah. you know. So, so I bridge. <laughs> I'm interested. I feel like I'm interested in everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I I signed up to do a history degree recently, okay, kind of part time, and I brought this up at a dinner party, and I was with dinner friends, and they're like, "Oh, that's so interesting. Why did you pick history?" 
And my answer to them was, no, I would have picked mathematics and economics and you know, linguistics. And that was just the course that came up at the time. So I'm, I feel like I'm interested in everything. It's a little bit too much, actually. And to live a really happy life, I ought to focus. Warren's just not interested in that stuff. It, he doesn't get off and he doesn't get excited about it. For him to be focused on earning a high return as capital is the only thing that he gets off on and a little bit of bridge. <laughs> he actually is that kind of, that narrow. And Coca-Cola. And it was an aha moment for me to, to realize yes. that even if I could be in his shoes, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. I'd be unhappy living that life. I, I, that would be kind of sad mm -hmm. for me. I think that when one talks to younger people, um, to help them to understand, and, and I don't know, I'm imagining myself standing next to you in the high school class and say, look, of course uh, you want to make money, but if you don't do something that you love and makes you money, you're not going to make very much money anyway. So, you, so yeah, it's a complex thing. It's a balance. Yeah, I'm not, it's not even a balance. It's like, don't, I, I know, I, you know, You've got to do something really, you've got to do some clever sleuthing to figure out a way to do something that you love that also makes you money. Mm -hmm. And you cannot give up on the thing that you love because you won't make very much money. Right. You know, you can't end up hating yourself, which is, which is a really hard thing to do. You know? yeah. So we have a, um, we have a bit, one of our businesses is called Luxury Escapes. We have these high-end rentals around the world. And a girl I went to high school with and college with, she's a doctor now. And we were exchanging, but she wanted to rent one of the houses. We were exchanging messages. And she goes, I picked the wrong career. And I laughed when she said it to me because I thought to myself, I was just fortunate that I love numbers. Yeah. I was fortunate that I understood numbers and investing at a very young age. And I, it's shocking how many people don't actually. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you know, so when, I, when she says that, I say to myself, I want to look at, but of course, the Paul 15 years ago would have said, well, Tiffany, here's why you're wrong. <laughs> the Paul now just chuckles and says, okay, move on. Because... She had a love for medicine and her love for medicine is going to make her a better doctor than any love for business, than any yeah. business that she, she ever started. Ever done. Yeah. Yes, no. because oh, she, she's what connection to you? Went to high school and college together. So a friend. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in passing. Yes. So here's what I'd want to say to her yeah. is, so she's a doctor and yeah. she's like, oh my God, I, it's like, um, I want to say to her, listen to that thought, that thought, there's something there for you. So the fact that you're having that thought. So it's not, you know, it's not give up medicine and go and become like Paul. Yeah. It's, you know, live with that, work with that. There's something, it's itching at you for a reason. Mm -hmm. There's some changes you need to make. Yeah. And if you That's make good. those, and, and, and I want to believe, you know, this beautiful idea that life always makes sense looking backwards. It never makes sense looking forward. So I'd want to tell her, look, experiment. I know that's not a happy or easy thought, but... But it's telling you that you're not where you're not at the destination. You're not where you need to be. You need to scratch and look and see what that's leading you to. So I really believe it's it's not about saying, "Well, you pick this and give it up." It's that's the and I love this idea, which I love saying to young people. I'm mean, imagining myself in the high school class with you. Like, Who's this funny talking and, guy? <laughs> and I, I funny talking guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to school in the states, so <laughs> but, uh, I, I love this. You know, people come up to me in the U.S. and they're like, "I love your accent." And my like, you have is, the accent. Yeah, <laughs> I don't have an accent. That's so funny. <laughs> you have the accent. <laughs> but so, and this is from. Have you read any Joseph Campbell? No. Mm -mm. I love Joseph Campbell. He's amazing. He taught it. He studied Sanskrit. He just, he's not very respected in the academic world, but so he says this. He that says, makes me want to talk. That makes me want to read him now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> he's, he's worth reading. So you enter the forest at the darkest point where there is no path. Because if there was a path, it wouldn't be your path. It would be somebody else's path. Yeah, that's so, a good one. So that feeling that your friend has of like, I picked the wrong career. It's like, oh my God, I'm lost in the mountains. That's okay. Now you figure out your path. And your path, what's that saying? Is your path is not 100% medicine. The fact that he's itching at you, the fact that you see your friend, you think, that's, that's okay, that, that feeling. So I feel like the times when I've been my most productive, the times when I've made the most progress is when I've lost sleep over feeling like I should be over there, but I'm here. And now the, the sort of like, how do we get ourselves over there? Because it's never easy. Like over there, so I remember sitting in my office at D.H. Blair, beginning mm -hmm. of the book, yep. sleaze bucket shop. Yep. 
I'm reading about Warren Buffett. I'm like, my God, that guy is not selling sleazy deals to investors that he doesn't believe in. He's, and I want to be there. And that is like the most empowering feeling because, because that is actually where life begins. It's like, my God, I want to be there, but I'm here. And this is an age-old thing. It's the caveman who sees the avalanche coming down the hill or the earthquake, or he's like, I want to be there. That's where the good fields are. That's where mm -hmm. the safety from the animals are. And we, are, we were built to solve those kinds of problems. So rather than do, I think too many people do the Buddhist thing, or spiritual bypass, we're like, oh, those yeah. are human desires. Just suppress them and you'll be happy. No, own those desires and let them motivate you. And yes, you don't see the path because it's your path. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to make mistakes. You might break your leg. You might run into thorns. You might run into bees. But, but figure it out. So yeah. I, I don't, don't, yeah, go ahead. And don't just chase money. That's a big one. But you know, the thing is, though, Mo, if, if anybody heard any three of us saying but that, I they'd be think, like, but, you're but I, do, I mean, no, that, I do that's the thing. It's but not just it's disingenuous. But, but it's we like have the money. Seat, but it's like, the, it's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe, but this, remember I told you about the CEO. So there's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Yeah. I went to his penthouse in. I was friends with his his daughter and my friend Nick, and we went. And I go there, and I'm sitting with him having breakfast one day. Everybody already flew back to Ohio, and this guy makes probably 50 million dollars a year. Beautiful penthouse, and I'm like, man, this is incredible. This this is just so awesome. And he's like, Mo, I I hate my life. He's like, this is awful. I hate doing what I do. So sorry. And what that's, does he do? He runs, uh, I'll tell you the company after we yeah. finish, but it's just, it's not the end all be all. No, no, People no. think that they accumulate money and they're just going to be happy. So to that you know point, I mean? to that point, don't chase tell, it. What, to that point, what no. I tell the kids in my, in the class, when I used to speak to them is guys, I can buy anything I want in the world besides a sports team, essentially. Right. Yeah. But I still have problems. I still have things that I, that, that cause me, that I, I'm not going to solve it all. Money is going to solve those things. The, yeah. the thing that Lisa always says, my fiance, I learned this from her 15 years ago was money magnifies. And that's the big thing. And I look at this thing, but you got to understand the perspective of somebody hearing somebody wealthy oh, saying that. That's what I'm sitting there yeah, saying. Of like, so that's why I like to focus. Say. Yes. Yeah. So what I tell them is, all right, kids, would you rather make $250,000 a year, but be miserable at your job or $100,000 a year and love it? And when I hear 95% of them say 250, but miserable, that's where I go, okay, well, why? And they say, well, because then I can go take vacations and buy the stuff that'll make me happy. I go, okay, that's what we need to work on. When was the last time you got something that would make you happy and now you're still, you're still upset? So the, the whole point of all this is to say, I do believe that the perspective the person's coming from is very important. But to your point, I have to factor it in when that's that their path. Like I look at Warren Buffett and I have immense respect for the guy. I love him. I also see some... Like I said, when he says I, we didn't want to make money fast, yes, you, you even say it in Snowball. Munger says it in other things. I'm like, you wanted to make money fast. You were, when you went to Vegas for your honeymoon, you were so excited because you're going to be rich because you saw the casino. And I'm more interested in talking about the journey along the way because I do believe enjoying that journey will lead to whatever you want it to be. And I don't believe the, I, the Buddhists don't say like suppress these feelings. I believe they say, it's not about, so, you know, as part of a good friend of mine, we talk about these ideas of enlightenment and things like that. And I used to, I have a lot of watches and I always feel guilty. Oh, you like watches? Love watches. Do I have we, 25 or 30 watches. watches on the show? Or? If you want to, we can. <laughs> Why, do you have watches? Do you like watches? Um, I, I, well, we'll talk about it. We'll get into okay. the <laughs> point. Yeah. So the whole point was I used to feel guilty because I do love, love oh, I want that watch. Yeah. And he would always say, no, Paul, it's not the desire that's the bad thing. Enjoy the desire. Like you said, have the desire. Yeah. The question is, if you lost this watch today, would you feel like less of a person? And I was like, oh. And that's where I don't like myself with my business and my career because I feel like there's too much of my self-identity attached to my business. And that's where I don't like that part of my journey. That's the part of my journey that I want to change. I've changed a lot of my journey, but the part I don't like is if all of a sudden I went under tomorrow, I would feel like... Not because you need the money, but because it gives you pride. Yes. Uh, Having bad returns, even though I don't need... I can make 0%. I can make 2% returns the rest of my life and never run out of money. But to me, my job is to get an adequate return on my capital. Now, the difference between me now versus later is if Guy Spear gets 17% a year and I get 12, I'm not going to look at that going, damn it, how did Guy get 5% more than me? I'm going to go, great for Guy Spear. Because yeah. I'm investing the way that makes sense to me, and if it means less returns, but but sleep well at night, I'm happy with that. By the way, Guy Spree doesn't have seventeen. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and by the way, Guy Spree, even if he did have seventeen percent, might do that for a decade, and then down nine yeah, percent. You know, and that's, that's <laughs> possible. So, but uh, 
Yeah, so much there. I know you want to say something. So no, I don't. I, uh, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I'm just reflecting. Me, by the way. I, yeah, you can't really I, see. I'm reflecting before going on to watches, which if you live in Switzerland, you end up being interested in watches. I was going to say, he, when, you said, when you said, does he like watches, I go, well, he lives in Switzerland. <laughs> no, okay, so what came up for me, so in part, one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book is, is just one of the reasons we saw my envy side of it. But um, it was in part, I found it fascinating. I started getting a little bit of success. And then people started saying, oh, yeah, that's because you went to Oxford. That's because you went to all the Harvard excuses. Business School. That's because 100,000 other people went to Oxford and they didn't do that. Right. And so I kind of wanted to really focus people on this sort of the way I'd crashed and burned around D.H. Blair. And then I really started learning what success is about. Mm-hmm. And um, so, I, so about chasing the money versus sort of like doing things that are meaningful and fun. And it's complicated for me. I mean, I'm trying to tease it out in my mind. So, you know, I read How to Win Friends and Influence People yeah. and Napoleon Hill and those, that kind of self-help genre. And so I figured out reciprocation. And now I'm literally walking around New York handing out sweets to uh, doormen, like whoever will, will take it, you know, because I'm like, I'm going to pound reciprocation. And I'm doing it in this really self-interested, kind of narrow, egotistical way. But, you know, I'm starting to kind of fall in love with the smiles I get. And then I'm writing notes, and every now and then something good comes back. And I'm doing it for very narrow, kind of pecuniary, I want to be successful. And, um, and then I get this sort of like a gush of love back at me. And so I start saying, when I'm writing it, it's, it's no longer just about the money and about possible success. It's about getting that love back. And, and now... I feel completely motivated by the fact that I know I'm going to unleash a whole bunch of love back and I'm going to make the world a happier place. And the money is a minuscule part of it. So sometimes I think, or if I take that example, chasing the, using the money as a motivator to do meaningful things or to have somebody, one of your hypothetical high school students who says, I'm going to look, I'm going to search for money, but by doing things that make me happy, or are likely to make me happy, then then I think it's a complicated relationship. I don't mm-hmm. think the right thing to say is forget about the money, because anyway, people aren't going to listen. Of course. But also the money's a motivator, but don't don't think that you can get to the result uh, without also trying to do things that you love and are interested in. Maybe it's something like that. I don't know. So the way I look at it with that is I'm very confident in my ability. Like, like you said, I love learning about lots of things. So for my satisfaction in life, I like playing guitar. I like playing tennis. I like playing basketball. I like, I have a chess player. I play every, I have a chess coach. Are you on chess.com? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I played 17,500 games since April 15, really? 2016. Oh my God. Yeah. What's your rating? Um, 17 and blitz really? is 17 oh, I'm so 30 en- i'm so envious <laughs> <laughs> why what's yours what's your rating so i had a belief i was a member of the manhattan chess club and oh, i you believed were. Yeah. It was like ages ago and i yeah. believed and also the one down on thomas street or something i don't know anything. And, and i believed that i hit 14 or 1500 but i went on a chess.com and i was like at 600 oh you'll and be I, fine and i don't think so now i'm sort of like pushing 950 i've been doing this for like about eight or nine on months. rapid or blitz what level oh so so i play the only thing i play is um uh what is it correspondence seven oh days. daily games so because but i i want time to make my moves yes you know i don't i don't want to like sort of have to because otherwise it's totally addictive i mean i learned blitz first of all bullet chess is ridiculous. Yeah, oh, I've yeah. tried playing bullet chess and I can't get to sleep for three or four hours. So <laughs> you know what bullet chess is? You make all your moves in one minute. You know, or you like do insane. two one. So it's funny. My fiance, yeah, that's our big stickler. Ridiculous. She's like, please stop. I'm like, what? She's like, you're playing chess again. I'm like, listen. That's I'm like, so listen. Hilarious. But you know what? I love it. And to me, this, this, I just want you all to know, 1700 is no slaps. That is a very, very good rating. That's well, impressive. thank you. Well, it's remember, really I, have, I have chess lessons every week, so I take it very, very <laughs> seriously. Maybe you can introduce me to a chess teacher. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> he would love to teach you. He lives in Minnesota. But, uh, uh, with, with the chess.com is so amazing because you can play over your games and it'll, yeah. it'll analyze them for them, show you all the places you've blundered. And, you know, and, Wonderful. I look at every, yeah. an, I analyze every game after. Anyhow, go so ahead. Yeah, I don't know what we were so saying. So I, so I like it. having the diversity of things to do. Yeah, yes, that's it. Oh, there that, we go. We're and, back on track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I like having that diversity, but that works for me. Yeah. Like you were saying, when you look at Warren Buffett being very narrow mind, like very narrow focused, yeah. I agree. I could never live that's that like, way. Like, you don't play chess. Wait, what's the point? Do you play bridge? No, I haven't learned bridge yet. Yeah. 
But you I play want, bridge, don't you? I, I can play bridge, okay. but, but I've never really played and gotten better and all okay. of those things. And yeah. it's a wonderful game. But I can't find the people to play with, and I don't want to do it online. It's a bridge. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing. But anyway, sorry, we went off. We went down another rabbit yeah. hole. So, so, you know, so, but I'll bring it back to that. We talked about chess, though, in more in detail. The Paul of 15 years ago yeah. would have said, Paul, why are you wasting your time playing? I've played 17,500 games of chess since April 15, 2016. I've missed one day. I've played 30,000 tactics. I have this mirror. And Paul 15 years ago said, you could have been advancing your career instead of doing that. Yeah. But now I look at it as, no, Paul, you're enjoying life. Like, you know, we're on Twitter, right? Yeah. And I see people on Twitter saying, oh, I didn't waste my time today doing this. I'm like, I don't believe in wasted time. I will sit there. On a beach, just sitting there thinking and going, this is what I'm paid to do. Like, I don't look at it as wasted time. Like, I, my job is to think. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to go back to chess. So what, uh, what do you play on chess.com? I play two things. I play five fives. Five, I, no, I play three five things. Plus. I play correspondence at daily games. Yeah. I play correspondence f- meaning how many hours daily. per move? No, so it's daily. Like, I do three-day three day moves. Three days a move. Okay. Yep. So I do three just, days per move. Yeah, but so I have five or six games going in at a given time. Yeah, I got like 25 or something. Oh, really? So, so then I'll, like, but how do you focus on those moves then? I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, guy, I'm gonna add, I, guy, I'm gonna add my you on chess.com right now. That's so funny. <laughs> no, what happened to me is like I went down a rabbit hole with this whole uh, Gaza and everything, and I was, you know, and suddenly I, I'm so I I pay the subscription, which means that if you miss, if you go longer than seven days, vacation on vacation. Yes, <laughs> we know this app. But um, then I'm like, holy moly, I'm behind on like eight games. So I just pull it out somewhere and I just, I just say, look, I've, I say, what the hell? So my rating will go down. I'll make a bunch of blunder moves. It's just my rating on chess. It doesn't matter, you know? But now do you, sorry, everyone. I do this two plus kinda... one. So for, bull, for Blitz, for Bullet yeah. though, I do two plus one. <laughs> do you do Lee Chess? I do. I like Lee Chess a lot. You know, I just, the, the interface, I mean, the, the chess.com app the interface is so good. So chess.com, yeah. chess.com is the best one, yeah. but Lee Chess's study um, program is far better. Is that right? Far oh, better. Oh, I'll have to do it. So with my chess coach, we're, but we still do chess because my chess coach works for chess.com part-time. So we use chess.com. I love chess.com, but I could literally sit there and like, there are literally times when I go, I'm going to go to the bathroom and I play chess because I look yeah. at it going, I, cause we become obsessed with it. I mean, it's 18,000 games or so in since April 15th of 2016. That's all I can make one day. But to me, that's not a waste. To me, you know, it's a beautiful thing. I, I used to play at the office. And then I decided I had to get it. So it was Internet Chess Club at the time. Oh, yeah, right? ICC. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I told myself I can't have any games. Then what happens to me is this is about a year ago. My wife, I so I don't take the phone into the bedroom. Very bad idea. Oh, good for, for you. That's a very it's, good idea. Uh, so my wife is she does take the phone into the bedroom. Is the right thing for her to do because in touch with our children, all of yeah. that. She needs to be reachable. So I think she's got some very important text going on with our children, and she's playing a game called Wudoku, which Wudoku. is kind of like Candy Crush. It's just sort of like mindless. <laughs> you know. That's great. So then, then I take her phone. And I'm like, oh, let's try this out. So now I'm playing Wudoku on her phone. She's like, give me my damn phone back. <laughs> you know? So then I installed it on my phone. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just sort of like Moorish. It's like eating peanuts. You know, you just yeah. like, it was satisfying. Something you to don't do. have to use your brain very yeah. much. And, and then I said, well, if I'm going to do this, and somebody was playing chess, so I found chess.com. And now I do have chess.com on my phone. But you know what the good and, thing is, though? To me, I want to distract myself from overthinking about investing. Like that that's is a great thing. excuse. No, I'm serious. <laughs> great excuse I'm going to use that. Chess. Guy, no, I'm when, serious about this. When Chantal comes into my office and says, Guy, are you doing investment research? I'm going to say, No. You know how many times my I'm mother is sure myself make any of it? So I have no shame about it. People walk in my office saying, Paul, can I talk to you? I'm like, I'm in the middle of a chess game. Please hold. <laughs> Because to me, it's... Yeah, that, those are the Blitz games. Those Blitz games are a freaking nightmare. Just night. And you know what happens is like you... So I get on, like it's 1-2 it's is all I will do. I think it's 1-2. I do 2-1, two, 2 plus 1. 2 plus 1. That is, the, that is way more time than the bullet 1. Mm-hmm. But, the, but even that is just impossible for me. And I'll lose a game because there's some blunder... And then you just that's what makes it fun, though. You've got to go back, yeah. <laughs> you to go back and do another one. And then, it's like, and then you and just then, keep going back. Then it's like 10, 15 minutes of four or five or six games, and I am just buzzed, and there's no chance I can get to sleep for like two or three hours. But anyway, I love just, it. How much time a day do you spend researching? Uh, so way more now than it used to be. So Really? You know, I was, yes, because 
I was, it was so funny. I mean, I started here in New York City and people, I'd meet people and I was single and they'd say, oh, you have your own business. That's nice. What's, you know, or they'd say, it's, I'd say it's a small business and I'm a, and they'd say, oh, what's your role? I'd say, well, you know, I'm the CEO. They'd be like, oh, wow, you're the CEO. So yeah, I'm also the post boy, the receptionist, you know, <laughs> CFO, accounts receivable, <laughs> accounts payable. I think that literally for the longest time until maybe only recently properly, there's been enormous investment of time in just all of that. Mm. And it's only in the last two or three or four years that I've been able to focus 80% of my time on investment research. Now, the investment research, very broadly defined. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I just love reading about everything. So. Yeah. And they kind of like try and moderate my interests at the office. So you know, I decided I, I, I gave up economics too soon. Like in a different version of my life, I would have liked to have done a PhD in economics. Yeah. So, so I go and subscribe to American Economic Review. And now there's the Damoglu, is this like famous economist for technology. And so I, I'm going down various rabbit holes there. Yeah. But I count that in investment research, if you like. And I try to spend a lot of my time reading. Yeah. But is that the majority of most days? And, uh, at the yeah, office, I, I'd like to say, you know, I mean, but my days are I try to I try to do sport very beginning of the day. Okay. I'm writing something. I try to write at the beginning of the day. My big problem is, do I write then do sport, or do I do sport then write? Right. Because like my brain is primed for doing difficult stuff. At the very the, the sooner I get started, the better. Yeah. And the further away I can stay from social media. And, right. And then you know, and then try and do reading and sort of like hard work, and then the afternoon more relaxing stuff is kind of my day. Yeah. Amen, brother. Yeah. Is that is that? What yeah, that's the way I do. Yeah, I, mean, listen, I want my I want my day to be packed in the more not packed, but I want to get my the most important eat that frog do the most important tasks. Eat that frog. I love that. It's a book. Is that right? Yeah, it says if you start every single day eating a frog, the rest of the day would be a lot easier. Do the most difficult thing at the very beginning, yeah. get it over and done with. And because at the end of the day, I also want to go home with a very positive feel for the day. Because I used to, I mean, that's that's the thing. I'm you know I'm very big on you know like I said, my fiance is older than me, and so she doesn't work, and you know we don't she doesn't need to work. But the whole point is we want to focus on family and things like that that we do, and I want to go home with a very positive feel with her, and that way it caught like. When people say reading, watching TV is a waste of time, no, completely disagree. I love watching TV with my fiance. We love right. watching our shows and saying, "Oh, what show do we have to watch? Yeah. What movie we're we going to watch?" You know, we watch we watch Seinfeld all the way through. We watch The Office, but to us, that's fun. Yeah. It's fun. It's a part of our. You know, yeah. we joke about it. like I. You know, I hate the whole idea of. You I read. Productive. We yeah. read a lot. She yeah. and I both do, yeah. and we enjoy reading. But at the end of the day, and by the way, you know, I love. I love reading fiction. People could, oh, why do you read fiction? I love fiction. So what have you been reading in the fiction world? Yeah. John Grisham. I, mean, I, yeah. I, I could read John Grisham. I got to read, right? read the new one. Oh, I just started I, it. Uh, so I've not read any John Grisham. But, you know, no. I had a reaction to Charlie Munger because he gets asked some questions somewhere where it's like, um, so do you read any fiction? And you know, I said, no, I'm kind of done with fiction. I've read pretty much. And I think, look, I think he's probably read a lot of fiction mm -hmm. and he's read many classics. But I said, screw you, Charlie. I'm not done with fiction. Yeah. I'm not freaking read fiction. But I'm working very slowly my way through a list of classics that I feel like uh, I don't want to die having not read. So, oh, the so, classics. So I'm, I'm now reading, well, I'm reading all sorts of other things in between, but I'm about halfway through this uh, Stendhal French novelist, Le oh, Rouge et Le Noir. And that's like, not man. up my alley. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> screw that, man. No, like, I mean, I like the classics like David Copperfield and yeah. right, things so like that. Not, I made not, myself read David. That was a long book as well. Yeah, but it's a, I think it was a wonderful, wonderful it? book. Yeah. I, I loved it. It was very emotional for me. I don't yeah, know why. Because, because he goes through a lot of I know, un, that's un, why. Un, undeserved hardship. Yeah, I know. And I was just like, and you know, it's funny because every single time I've uh, got another topic of things, like things I like to collect, right? And, so I like rare bookstores. So we were in London back in, when did we go to London? I went up to London with my fiance in 21. June or July. No, June or July oh, this, this year. this time, okay. So we go there and I always look at, um, you know, rare bookstores. So I walk in a rare bookstore and I'm like, hey, security analysis, because I have a signed copy of security analysis, third yeah. edition. Yeah. And it might've been lost in my current move. We're still trying to figure <laughs> that out. Anyway, so I always, I'm always looking for David Copperfield, like a first edition and I can never find it. So I go to this rare bookstore I asked about security analysis. He shows me what he's got. I'm like, eh, these aren't signed, blah, blah, blah. So I leave. And I'm walking out. My fiance says, Paul, what about David Copperfield? No, she says, what about that one you're always talking about? I'm like, oh, David Copperfield. I'm like, yeah, they won't have it. She goes, just go in there and ask. They had it. They had it. <laughs> I, I it's funny. So, it. So I, have, I have zero interest in you know, original editions. Oh, really? Books. Do you collect no. anything? Pardon? Do you collect anything? 
Uh, not really. I, so I just, I want lots of books around me and, you know, I love this concept of an anti-library. So yep. what we started doing actually, so at the office is about, I think it's about 3000 books in the office, another 2000 books at home, but vast majority of them not read. Yeah. And uh, so it's the anti-library and we started cataloging them. So now it's laid out with, they have kind of the, the, the library of Congress cataloging That's system awesome. and we have an online catalog actually. So you okay, come on. Go, it's on library thing. So wow. library things, fun things. We, the, the catalog of the books that we have in their that. location is on library thing. And uh, it's kind of fun. But, wow. uh, and I just want a, collection, a large collection of books that I'd like to read all of them. And for me, you know, uh, Heaven is one great big library. And I'm so envious. And, and in part, this is kind of ADHD. I mean, the, the, the listener and you guys, the reason why I'm going down rabbit holes is because my attention jumps but what happens in a library is i can just sit there with books yeah. and read and i feel like i have a my brain is calmed down and a great day for me is four or five hours in the library see i can't do that I, I gotta i gotta split it up and i gotta read multiple books at a time that's as long as they're different i can't read three books fiction at a time it's gotta be one fiction yeah, yeah, yeah one that's... investing book one something like that but it, you know i know it's so funny i live on wikipedia i love those i love like learning about things but at the same point you know, like, like I always tell people my favorite class in college was astrology, S astronomy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> astronomy, because it merged, you know, this unknown of space with, yeah. with, with numbers. And I don't know, I just, I get, I get upset because I feel like people look at these successful people, like I used to, and say, like, if I was 10 years, 15 years old right now, learning about Charlie Munger, I would say, you know, he sits there and criticizes people who want a Ferrari or want a Rolex. Like, why would you ever want to wear a Rolex? Like, hey, pal, you have seven houses. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear it. Like, you know, that's the thing that I looked at. The thing, the biggest change for me in investing yeah. was knowing that everybody's just different. And yeah. the same thing with life. Like, yeah. you know, Charlie Munger might sit there and say, you know, when he criticizes Warren Buffett flying private. Yeah. But then he has seven houses. I, I'm yeah, not saying they're equal. I'm just sitting there saying, well, Warren Buffett says, I love the idea of being able to jump on a plane and go wherever I need to go and be back yeah. home when I need to yeah. be back home. Because we talk about getting a private plane at some point in the future for one reason. I want to be home as fast as possible. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I love the fact that you're pointing out inconsistencies in Charlie Munger. My perceived inconsistencies. They might not be. So I, two things. One really interesting. So the night before, so I still own the same Porsche that I bought 17 years ago. I know because I bought it at the time that my son was born. Mm -hmm. It was, I was having a, a second of many midlife crises. I was like, my God, I'm getting a second child. I need a sports car. Yeah. And it's so funny because it's not like I actually think that. What happens is I'm suddenly interested in Porsches and I'm coming home to my wife and I'm saying, I don't understand. This is ridiculous. The speed limit here is 55 miles per hour. This thing can go three times the speed limit. Why do I I'll never drive it. Why would I want it? My wife was so wonderful. She's like, you know what? You want it? You can afford it. Just go out and go buy it. it. So now I have this Porsche, which I still own today, and I'm proud of the fact that it's turning into an old timer. And Monish arrives in New York City the night before with his two daughters uh, because we're going to have lunch with Lauren Buffett the yeah. next day. And so we, I drive them around in New York City with the top down, which is kind of fun. You can see all the buildings and stuff. And now uh, Monish decides to sort of like rib me a little bit in the sort of like, this guy's a spendthrift. He's got a Porsche, you know, like we serious investors. Now like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he did that. Now we got rid of it. Yeah. And so he talks about the Porsche. And this thing just, it just, like, the Porsche just like flies over Warren's head. I don't know if Warren doesn't know what a Porsche is. It's possible. <laughs> or, or, or he just doesn't give a shit. Yeah. He just it's doesn't just give a shit. It's interesting to him yeah. at all. And some people like having a yacht. Some people don't. Yeah. Some would be, if, if you can afford it and you've, you've got the money, yeah. and have it if you want it. But So that's one side of it. I think that I have seen in my life people who buy cars, watches, sort of trophy objects because they have a sort of sense of lacking. Oh, oh, I'm lacking. What am I lacking with my no, watches? I'm not, I'm not saying that it's <laughs> the case with you because I think there are many different motivations, but they, 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 they have a sense of like, they, they, they feel like they need to display of course. how successful Success, they are because yeah. there's something missing on the inside. Of course. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to a kind it of... It goes a, back to the inner scorecard. Yeah, so scorecard. that that is not a good motivation from which to have, you know, I think the... And I think that Charlie, in part, he wants to dissuade his grandchildren from doing stuff like that. But the motivation of, I have the money, either I'm going to let it sit in the bank account or I'm going to own this thing and mm -hmm. I can afford to own it, so I'm going to go get it, mm -hmm. 
is fine, but there are other motivations as well, which can be less. There are, I mean, I, we talked a little bit about these people who sell uh, courses that they should not sell, yeah. or on, you know, and I'm blown away because I really wanted to see it. And so I, it's not that easy to find, but there are people who sell self help courses, kind of tacky self help courses. And they stand in front of a Ferrari or a McLaren. Oh, it's constant. Those are rented most of the time. Totally. Did you see and the new trend? So they'll have a, what looks like, they'll basically have the fuselage of a private jet here in this room. And you'll go sit inside of it and take your pictures. And then you leave. You leave the, out of the front of the building. So <laughs> the, the amazing thing is that if I'm not mistaken, I may be that some of these people, they don't make any bones about it. Yeah. But it still affects the viewer. Right. Mm -hmm. Still impacts right. them. Exactly. And so um, I, I, I don't know why. It's just fascinating. I'm not sure Listen, why. Listen, there's, it like up, you but... said, there's a, you know, because I always say that, you know, it's funny whenever I, I we pass somebody who has a, uh, like a loud car, you know, I do with my fiance. I'll be like, hey, look at him. His penis is really big. You know, it's like that kind of thing. I'm making a joke about that because they, they rev their engine. We all have motivations about thinking, and this is something I really do struggle with. What you said, though, because even though I went, "Oh, that hurts," because I think to myself, "Well, am I buying these watches because I'm I trying?" Don't to... so. I, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Case. But at the same point, there are different motivations. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I would joke with people. I say, I say, if it was all about ego for me, why do I live in Cleveland, Ohio? Yeah, literally, you could not pick a less sexy city <laughs> in the world to live in than Cleveland, Ohio. It I mean, has a reputation. It has its charms, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 Did that come across that badly? Oh, horrible. <laughs> that came across absolutely. The fact that Have you been? A, but you know what that was? No, he hasn't you lost know, any you know, I've been in the airport once. You know what that was? That was a classic ones. example of damned by faint praise. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. That was incredible. And the best part was when he first walked in and said, I'm like, I love them this way. He's like, I was in St. Louis. That's an interesting city. And I'm like, I love St. Louis. <laughs> like, I, my brother was born in St. Louis. We lived there yeah, for three years. I think it's a great town. But that's the thing. Like, I look at this stuff and I look at the city here and I look at New York City and I'm out here going, and I look at my fiance saying, I, I could never live here. This is a very absolute, like, I, you know, witness protection program. There's a joke I always make that I say, if, witness if I ever went to witness protection, they would put me in Boston, New York, LA, Miami, mm -hmm. because they tell you, we're the cities you tell everybody you want to live in. We're not sending you there. Right. And I, cause I, I look at the city like this and listen, I love London. I think it's the best city in the world. I could never live there. But nothing makes me more excited than, oh, we're going to London. Love London because it's such a wonderful – but I need to be – if you told me, Paul, 100-acre farm or London in a penthouse, I'd I pick the farm because I just look at it going, I like being quiet, and that fits my personality. But at the same time, there are things I used to do. Look at that. He owns a house right now that I built 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I joke with people now. They said, why would you build that house? I'm like, because my ego needed that house. And I absolutely did back then. Is it a beautiful house? Well, it's it was nice also house. very large, yeah. and it was—I was, was twenty-seven at the time, building this stupid monstrosity. And now I looked at it as going, "Hey, you're just dissing the house that your friend lives it in." It is <laughs> awesome. And I always—we yeah. <laughs> were—we were at lunch at Chipotle before we came here, and I said, "God, I love that house. If it was only on land, I would have stayed in that." Even Lisa, she's like, "If that house is on land, because it's in a neighborhood." But I look at that, and you know, now Lisa and I—we—we—we we, we have a house. It's beautiful, but it's on fifteen acres. So that's what we no, want. I'll just give you a bit of the ethos of Zurich that I fell in love with. If you haven't been, maybe now that I've primed you with this, you'll tune into it when you're there. And I, I can't trace. I'm staying at your house when I come there. Oh, sure. I, I'll, I'll introduce you to the owner. Maybe you can maybe we get a deal done. done. <laughs> hey, guys, name... good news and bad news. I'm your landlord. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you just induced him to sell it to me. Oh, yeah. got it, got it, got it. Okay. But so, so there's this, this thing in Zurich, it's got to do with Protestantism, and I don't fully understand it. But um, so the, the, in Zurich, and people who think the way, so, so if you have a fur coat, the fur is on the inside. And okay. on the outside, the coat looks like everybody mm -hmm. else's coat. You know that you have a fur coat on, yeah. and your friends maybe know, but that's enough. And it's this idea of um, hidden wealth. Right. You know, so there's a bunch of things where you kind of see, my God, there's a shitload of money there. And it's kind of like just showing, yeah. but very, very subtle. And I yeah. kind of like really enjoy it. And, and, and when you see people who are just doing a full-on display, it becomes kind of tacky because like, why do you need to display it? You know? I, well, always, like, question, I always question that. Maybe it's a cynic, but I question those people. I'm like, do they really have the money? 100%. Because why are they showing it like so that? Here's Some a of them don't. Guy, yeah, here's a great don't. story. He and I were once at a cigar shop. 
And <laughs> before COVID, yeah. I never bought any car new. Ever. Yeah. I don't care what it was. I had beautiful yeah. cars. Never bought them. Lose X percent. I get them used. I thought to myself, listen, if I'm not, and by the way, we have beautiful cars, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to run in the list, but very, very nice vehicles where people. But it was funny. We were once at a cigar shop, and this guy who has far less money than us, he literally begs us to do business with him. He called us animals because we bought used cars. And I remember leaving going, Mo and I were just like, that idiot. Like we were making fun of him going, he's calling us animals. We make probably 10 times more than this guy does. And he thinks we're the suckers because we buy it. Because he doesn't understand it because he has a different value system. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. Completely different. And our absolutely. value systems change over time. And you're talking about how you're, you know, the house that you build is now not the house that you want to live in. So. Yes, exactly. Well, for the, you know, and that's the thing. Like, but. But do I have the same? Do I have the same snobbery about watches? Absolutely. I wrote on Twitter the other day. I said, "I'm sorry if you're a businessman in a business suit, and you're wearing an Apple iWatch. I just can't take you seriously anymore." That was my comment. <laughs> I was like, "I know this sounds completely arrogant. I'm like, I'm sorry, like because you can buy a reasonably nice watch for a thousand dollars. It was kind of like a joke, but it also wasn't. But you, the whole point of it is." Things matter to certain people so, at certain so Hannah, times. It's interesting. So for you, the Apple iWatch is kind of tacky. I love it for working out. Yeah. I love it for physical activity. Right. I just think to myself, when I see somebody in a suit wearing an yeah. Apple iWatch, I, for some it's reason I go, tacky. that is not yeah. the watch for that outfit. So, um, you know, it's funny because... And there's probably me, hypocrisy in there blatantly, no, no, no. but yeah, go ahead. For me, like, I'd rather see somebody wear a swatch, which is somehow fine, yeah. and many other different kinds of watches. Mm-hmm. I find I found that as I when I moved to Switzerland, um, the subtlety around watches and what it signifies about you sort of went through the roof. Mm. And uh, you know what's fascinating is in in Zurich you see a lot of Porsche nine elevens, and it's kind of like uh, the Hyundai of other parts of the world. Uh, it's kind of a, a normal. They're car. all over, and, yeah. And you would raise your eyebrows if you see a uh, what's the. Um, I don't know, a Bentley, a Bentley convertible saying, now the person is showing off a yeah. little bit and is kind of displaying a little bit. But, but a straight it's straight Similarly with, you know, a really fascinating sort of like um, fulcrum brand for me is Rolex. So in many parts of the world, Rolex is a high-end luxury watch. And in, for many people in Switzerland, that's like a basic model. Yeah. You know, you can go beyond that. Yeah. And I just Patek. because... It, because I, pardon? It's like a pet so, so here, okay, so I need to do some psychotherapy here with Paul. And <laughs> so, so I fell in love with a model. It's the world time at Patek. Uh-huh. I don't know why. It's like this Porsche. It's like, I don't freaking need it. You know, like, it's a ridiculous amount of money to pay for a watch. How much All is this it? Thing. How it much like, is it? It was like $50,000, something okay. like that. You, so I actually go into the Patek shop, which is like Bayer is the company that sells it, and I actually look at it. And it's beautiful, but I'm like, I cannot justify this. So then what Patek do on me is that they discontinue the model. Oh, so now oh. it's $150,000. So I can't yeah. even <laughs> buy it new. So I, this yeah. has like been going on for like a decade. And so they bring out a new model of the, uh, of the World Timer. I hate it. Oh. Yeah, I can't stand it. I hate it. It's just, it's not... It's not the same. Anyway, I have not bought a Patek Philippe watch. And I do joke with my children because I kind of like when I walk past the shop, I'll point out that one or a similar one. I'll say that's the watch that I will never buy because I don't need it. Trying in my own mind to educate them about something, what's what you need in life and yeah. what you don't need in life. And then a year ago, because I got interested in investing in the luxury goods space, I decided I wanted to get the experience of buying a luxury watch. <laughs> so I went into the Bukhara which mm-hmm. now Rolex has bought, and I went and bought myself a Rolex, and now I wish I'd worn the Rolex. I carry it around with me. I've got my Garmin on. It's probably worse than an Apple Watch for you. And I bought a Rolex. Which one? Yeah, so which one? I bought, uh, you know, oh, shoot. It's, um, it's supposed to be for engineers. It's got a green something. It's not, it's, it's not a well-known model. Okay. And it's kind of, I didn't want something that kind of like was in your face and yeah. somebody could recognize. It's not the diving yeah. model. It's... Yeah. And is it embarrassing? I can't remember. No, not at all. Milgauss. Oh, Mil- oh yeah. I was about to say, is it a Milgauss? But I didn't know that was for engineers. <laughs> That's a good watch. So, That's a great watch. It's a lovely watch. And I do wear it sometimes, but I'm hyper aware of what it might be saying about me. Hmm. And I. What is it? Why what do you, you feel that way? Yeah, what do you why think do you feel it's saying about you? Um, then why'd you buy it? 
Well, let me ask you a question. Because <laughs> I just needed the experience. Let me, let me I want to come with me to go out. I'll give well, you the money and say, buy me. Buy, so from I, now on, when you want the experience, I want to buy something. I'll say, guy, here's the money. <laughs> you go buy it for me. Just give them my name. No, I, I needed to do the psychotherapy. I need to call you up right. and say, Paul, why am I doing this? Do I really want to? Guy, I also find it interesting. Why, why do, you, do you feel that way in a society that you live around where everybody just has a Rolex? So I, I think that the people who wear a Patek Philippe around me when I notice it, and I think that other than this world timer, which I really, really liked, I think there's a model called the Nautilus. Yeah. It's kind mm-hmm. of extremely low key. That's just the one I got my fiance. It's a beautiful. And that's what yeah. I love about it, how it doesn't scream Patek. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's this, this totally like fur on the inside. Yeah. So, so, the, you know, I love this idea the people who know, know, and the people who don't know, yeah. don't need to exactly. know. Yes. That, it's kind of like quietly exudes power, right. if you like. And it's, it's, it's incredible branding. Um, you know, I, I kind of wore it a little bit. And then I decided I didn't want to be a guy who wears Rolex. I didn't want, to, I didn't want that kind of branding around me, at least not most of the time. But just be you, guy. If you, want, if you like the thing, you like the thing. It's I one think- thing if you're walking around going, oh, hi, um... Could you please tell me where... No, that, there's a no, difference I between think, that. I think I need to go and buy that world timer because I actually really like that How watch. much is it? It's a, uh, you, you mean the old one? The, the one that you wanted? You're going to look it up? I'm going to look it so up on... I'm you going to tell you the model number? It's that bad. I can tell you. Come on. So it's the... Um, you know everything something about P, it. Something P, you know? P. If you look up the model, what are you going to go to? Are you going on watch? Chrono 24. Chrono 24. Because you yeah. want the used one. You want the one that was previously made. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I, I can't remember the model number. Which one of these is it? Is it one of those? <laughs> look at this. Uh, so um, scroll down. Maybe it's, I just looked up world time. Uh, yeah. So, so it's 50,000 bucks. There we go. There you go. It's the same price. No, no, no. That's what I bought it for. Sorry, that sorry, one? sorry, sorry. That's terrible. I didn't. Uh, that's okay. Like inflation never happened. So that's the thing. Like I feel like we all spend. I think like the people who. So here's the tr- here's the progression I have seen, guy, in my experience yeah. with with being more self aware about our um, shallowness and not in the shallowness, but we go to these extremes. Like I went from I need to exude my wealth so that people see how wealthy I am, so it makes me feel better, to the other extreme of I need to hide it completely. To now I'm just. I'm just going to do what I like doing. My father is very much of a hide it completely person. But, then, then, but, but I think your dad, I don't know if your dad is the same. It, maybe wait, it's Middle Eastern, but it's the hide it and don't tell anybody. Wait you have till anything. you have children. I want to find it now. And well, what's with the children? Yeah, well, tell me about the children yeah. thing. Well, you, you, don't wanna, you don't want to put on a bad so, example. Yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. So you know what the great news is? You know what the great news is? I've got three. My, my fiance has three kids. They're all grown. Two are married. One has a child. Part of the reason I tell her I'm glad that we're not having kids is that I can live the life I want to live and not have to worry about just making some kids spoiled rotten. I'm like, I yeah. want to be able so to... So they're, they're fully grown. Yeah, they're okay, fully I've grown. I've just remembered the model number, so I'm now going to put the... Type, type 5130. 5130. This is terrible. Like, no, it's like not terrible. Uh, is that the one? You know, I couldn't name half the, I, I couldn't name half the watches I have because I like them for the way they are. That's hilarious. So, so yeah, they, they, actually there's more come onto the market. So the top two ones How much? Are, uh, it's like 50 or 60. Oh, 47? So. That's nothing for you, <laughs> guy. Come on. 47,000. That's a nice watch. You know, actually, I tell you something I did, which was really I learned a lot. So um, we, we bought this house in London, That's and I fell in love with it. I love, I love this house that we have in London. And, um, and now my wife gets into it, and it's, it's like... She oh, you own the house. Kitchen. Yeah. We own a house in London, in London. that is rent. not... And we rent the house that is actually home, and this is uh, all fucked up. Did I just say that? All effed up. So, um, so now we move into the house because we had three children at boarding school in the time, so we're using it a lot. And um, my wife says she needs a new kitchen. This this happens. Well, I just want you to know. That. Oh, be prepared. Let's not get into it. Please don't trigger him. When we're done with He's- the video. I will explain to you the current fiasco I'm involved with on a... I will uh, leave the uh, room for that conversation. <laughs> yes. well, I, I, I can go on record on all of this because I'm... So, so what happens to me is... So we, we, this is about four or five years ago and um, our children are... We're soon going to be empty nesters and suddenly we have this deep desire to create honey traps for our children so that they don't kind of like... They've got places to come back to, infrastructure. Yeah. Yep. So we've, we've got... We've also bought a place in Closters in the mountains, and um, 
And there, Laurie has designed the kitchen that she wants. And I'm I'm blown away because I'm we've, we're moving into this place. It's a ski place. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of sitting in the living room thinking about whether we did things right or wrong. And I realize that my wife really doesn't care. She's, <laughs> she's in her new kitchen and she's in another world. I realized that how happy a new kitchen made her. And I say to her, you know what, Laurie? I said no on the new kitchen in London. I was wrong. Yeah. Um, you can go get a new kitchen. Within five minutes, she's called up the kitchen contact. She's like, <laughs> she took it to heart. She's like, literally, she's like, it's a go. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's getting all that nailed down. She had that contact so, on to, to speed back, dial. But, and, and lesson is, what I learned, and I really do believe this, is kitchen uh, meals, family around meals, mm-hmm. is way more important than this stuff. I, I used to think, well, she wants a new kitchen. No, I'm getting a new car first. Mm-hmm. And now I joke about it. I say, I, I need to buy you your new kitchens uh, before I can even do one of them. You know, <clears throat> so, that. you know, it goes back to your story earlier about uh, the rich man dies, how much do you have, how much do you leave, all of it. Yeah. You know, there's a healthy balance. And this is the cover, you know, my, so my fiance would never... Whenever she wants to do something, ironically, by the way, the funny part is, you know, I, I, even though we have, all, I still have budgets, and she's yeah. always like, she's like, why do we have my Because I'd like to know what we're spending. My budget's always bigger than hers. I'm the spender actually, but when it comes to the home, she used to be interior designer. But I also look at it as, to me, home is very important. Yeah. Where I'm going to rest my head, and yeah. where I want everybody, all the kids. You know, she's got three kids. They have, they're married. They're going to have kids. We want nine, 10 grandkids. I want them to feel like they're going to our house to have a great, great time. Yeah. I don't have a desire to have 10 homes. I don't have a desire to have, I have a desire to have two homes. To me, that's so important to me that I'd sit there and say, especially with a wife, but, but something like if you said to me car or upgrade the house, I'd say upgrade the house, but that's for me. Yeah. But I look at that as like, but you know, to me, it's just a, I don't know why for me that's just a it makes sense. But if you said to me, Paul, watch, like, but Jean, but clothing, I spend as little as possible on clothing, but my watches and my belts and my I will spend on those. It's just everybody has a different thing. Yeah. Yeah. And for women, it t- we, listen, I'm in the apartment business. We know kitchens and bathrooms sell every woman in the world. So we spend all our money on kitchens and bathrooms. I had never understood that. Oh, 100%. It's all I, you it know, I never understood. You go to a, I'd go to a house. I'd see completely. The women, they go straight to look what's in the uh, kitchen. Listen, I'm, I'm programmed that way now with, with, with kitchens and bathrooms. Yeah. My, my, my fiance, she's just like, I taught you well. I'm like, you have. Like, I'll look, see a house. I'm like, I'm like, that's a $3 million home. They have a, they have a $200,000 um, home kitchen in there. And she's like, I've taught you well. I'm like, oh, that's garbage. <laughs> We're not looking at that. But that's where I look at because I like those things. But then I'll see something like, um, well, what's something I make fun of that people spend money on? Oh, the same people who criticize that, then they buy freaking Bitcoin. And I'm like, you guys are idiots. Or, like, you know, I- or just, I mean, one of the biggest examples is Penn Gaming. You know Penn Gaming stock? I don't know it very well. Well, but- it was a, it, their casino gambling, whatever. When Dave Portnoy, he's a big personality, Barstool I, Sports. He's a funny guy. Hilarious. He is. He's but, a, well, a very genuine you know guy. It's funny you said very. that. Funny guy. Our friends bought Penn Gaming because Dave Portnoy partnered Barstool with Penn Gaming, right. and this stock went crazy, and they all started it buying it. Buying meme stock. And this was yeah. all during, it was during the meme stock times. Went to 140. But I look at these things. But they bought it because Dave Portnoy is a funny guy. And they all got mad at me because they're like, I said that. I said, oh, imagine me buying a stock because it's because uh, I like the, one of the partners. And they all said, we're, all, we're wrong. Well, the price went up. What do you mean? Have you had... David Portnoy on this show. Uh, we reached out to tried. him, and he, he has said no. If you have any access, please let us I know. I don't have any Because we went to the same college, so we have the Michigan Portnoy. thing. Which college? Michigan. Michigan. University of Michigan. He, he, he'd, be great. he'd be way better than me on this show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, this is, this is this fabulous is awesome. for you. I just, you know why I like the conversations? I don't like the conversation that people have with a lot of people who are internet, because I'm not going to sit here, like I said to you before, and like, so what kind of free cash flow yield do you like? like, like it's like, to well, me, I, I want to talk that. more about the philosophy. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well literally, I, I, pu- I watched a bunch of your interviews previously, and I was like, I don't want to ask the questions that, that you're going to come in here and you know the same freaking questions you're going to get every no, single no. time. The funny thing is, what happens to me is I'm like, why do they still want to speak to me? I feel like I've said everything. What's fascinating is- And that's what it is. I want to pull something out of you that you but, haven't said. But what's said. fascinating is it's, like, it's a whole different experience. I mean, I've never yeah. had a conversation like this online. Yeah. There's a, I've never talked about Protect Philippe watches, you know. <laughs> Now, now what's going to happen is that damn model, the price is going to double. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> somebody's going to make money off you now. But to, like, me, yeah. but to me, the, the numbers are the easy part. Whenever people say like, oh, how'd you, you're good it's at numbers. Like, the numbers are the easy part. It's yeah. just like, listen, the bottom line is, 
and completely dumb it down. You have a free cash flow yield. Are you going to pay more or less for the company than what the going rate should be? Well, do they have good RM? All these factors. Okay, other than that, though, the question is, when it falls in half, are you still going to believe in it? Yeah. When it and falls 90%, then that has yeah. nothing to do with numbers. Yeah, and you know, it's like, you can, the, the simple thing is just don't only do it when whatever number you're looking at is a single digit. You know, it's like it's like a seven or eight or five, whatever that mm -hmm. multiple is, is probably a good one. And if it goes to double digits, stop. Yeah. You know, I, and, and that's, so, it's easy. It, and that, well. but, but that's why I spend so much time thinking about the emotional aspect of everything in life. Yeah. You know, even of, of things like you know watches. You know, my father. My father is a very. I, I love him. He's a very uh, cheap man. So like he looks at. Uh, like he looks in the at, best possible way. The best possible, no, I tell him that. You know, the guy's obsessed with golf, and I always joke with him and say, "Dad, you're obsessed with golf, and your golf clubs look like you went to a garage sale. You went to eight <laughs> different garage sales and bought eight different, you know, sets, and you combined them." He's he's my kind of guy, man. I love my. So sorry. He just, would never look at a forty-seven, fifty thousand. He would never even consider a fifty thousand dollar watch. So 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 we get this new place, and my wife has got all the coffee mugs that look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I hate that. I want, <laughs> I want, I want everything. everything. I want lots Boutique of different look, kinds yeah. of coffee mugs. No, I want so the she, same. I want so, the same. So, yeah, so you and my wife would get <laughs> yeah. on fire. So there's like one, and she's like, that's all, all I'm having. I'm like, honey, I need another few. And then, like, and then the fights begin. But anyway, sorry, your dad and golf club. No, but I look at that thing. I, to me, the psychological, because I look at my father also, and then I see him talk about companies and investing, and I just think, oh, wow. Like, I love him, but he, he's a physician. But I'm like, dad. So I always joke with people. My comment to people is, I see people brag about how they negotiated so hard to save a thousand dollars on a car, but then they won't do a half second of research on a company they're buying and just say, we'll just go buy hey, is this a reasonable multiple for this company based yeah. on this? You know, and that's where I get the, the maybe I'm taking it to an extreme, but these aspects of talking about value versus price, to me, watches the ultimate in value versus price. You know what else I love buying? Yeah. Purses for my fiance. I think purses are oh, so absolutely include bags. What was that? Does this include bags? The bags, the purses, yeah. So, so Birkin bag? Absolutely. We have one in order. <laughs> it's coming. Because you know why? I look at that thinking to myself, that to me is exclusivity, value, and look at the market. You pay $20,000 for a bag. You can't buy that bag for less than $70,000. We're not selling it. But the yeah. point to me is I look at that as the Ferrari of everything. Like, it's funny. Roll after COVID hit. Then nobody had watches. Yeah. I loved it. Because to me, I was like, I hated it when I wanted a watch and I found out that somebody just came in off the street and randomly saw the watch there at the right time. Yeah. I love when dealers are more exclusive and Rolex and Patek are more exclusive saying, hey, you know what? So we were so look at Ferrari, for example. We had looked at a Ferrari. We went to a Ferrari dealership. You know what they said to me? Paul, buy a used Ferrari, get in the system, come in own it for six months, then put an order in, and within two years, you'll get a Ferrari. I loved it. We didn't do it, because we, we, but the point was, I loved the fact that they sat there and said, this is our price, and this is our value. Yeah, they're amazing that way. To me, that's the Actually, value investing. As an owner of Ferrari, I say, we're amazing in that yeah, way. Exactly, because you're exactly an owner. Right. But that's the thing, like, I look at that saying, well, you, 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 for one reason or another, understand um, the luxury goods space, and the vast majority of people, I didn't understand it two years ago. I didn't understand I, it two years ago. It's really I never even heard of a Birkenbag. And I still have a hard time. Sucker. I didn't. Oh, I didn't I didn't know Birkenbag until until I started looking at Hermes as a company to invest in. I didn't even I know what I never even heard of Hermes in my life until I started dating. You know Nicole. we were right before we came here? We were at Hermes. It's an amazing company. Do you know it we is. Were? It really we is. were literally Hermes is my favorite. We were literally at an Hermes store buying me a uh, buying me a uh, man purse cuz so, I love them. So it's funny. I love them. You, you say that about understanding the luxury space because I never understood hotels like i would look at a four seasons and all i look at is the price and i just go eight hundred dollars a night a thousand what are these people crazy yeah. you don't know it until you go and experience it after i experienced it one time i was like okay now so i understand it i'll give you one experience i had in a four seasons and, and so one is that i promised a group of friends i'll never go back to vegas unless we stay in the four seasons mm -hmm. it's the only hotel in vegas that doesn't have slot machines and i mm. hate those slot machines. <laughs> but i remember staying in a four seasons hotel and I'm a single guy at the time, and so I get served by a young lady, and we get into a conversation, and she's it's the most amazing conversation. I think, my God, this is somebody I could date. I get more into the conversation. She's a college graduate. Mm. And I learned that at the Four Seasons, the people who work in the hotel are a completely different class of person. And yeah. how lovely is that? You can have an intelligent conversation with any of yeah. them, and, and you're not actually sitting in the hotel with some wait staff. You're actually sitting in somebody's living room. Right. 
an amazing place. And the customer place. service. So my favorite customer service story is about the Ritz Carlton. And I was watching a YouTube video on them. And they, there was a hockey tournament. Kids were in town. Parents were staying at the Ritz. And the kids were playing hockey in the hallway. And somebody complained. So the staff went upstairs and said, you guys, you can't play hockey in the hallway. 30 minutes later, the staff goes back up, knocks on everybody's door and says, we want all the kids to come down to the ballroom. They set up a rink in the ballroom and the right. staff played hockey with the kids. Yeah, how, and it's how just like, so you're that, not getting that at a Holiday Inn. And, and, <laughs> and by the way, that's what makes me think, to go back to your comment about Warren Buffett, that's what makes me think he doesn't care about Porsche because I do think that Warren Buffett understands price and value. Like when I see him talk about his private plane, or not, not anymore, he has net jets, right? But I look at that saying, here's the, he just doesn't care. He's got a Rolex, but he's just like, I just want one. He does wear a Rolex. Yeah, he has a Rolex. That's right. But, That's but right. You, know, you know, then there's a story about him and his daughter bought him a, a, a jacket once and he re- gave it back to her and he wrote the note, I already have a blue blazer. You know, but some <laughs> things just don't matter. That's what I respect. Like to me, you know, I, food. I have zero desire to eat high-end food. You could, like my, I only do it for my fiance. She likes those high-end things, and I just tell her one rule. I'm allowed to make fun of anything I can make fun of the entire time. We went to Chipotle ahead of time because yeah. we weren't with our, our fiancés. We were just like, I'm like, listen, I want to eat. You want to Chipotle? He's like, absolutely, let's go to Chipotle. To me, that's what I love about the people who sit there and say, this is important to me. I'm going to focus every dollar on this one. Yeah. This is not important to me. I couldn't care less. But if it's important to my fiancé, we're, we're going to be married soon. Like, yeah. If it matters to her, I do it. So, so I'm curious. You, you probably you, what? What is it about high end? I, what is it about high end food that you don't like? I don't like the whole pretentiousness of it. And the right. other thing is, I don't think it even tastes that I, great. That's my yeah. thing. Is I, so I, I, I don't wanna, appreciate it for the palate. I guess. So I, I went up an incredible learning curve on wine and food. Uh-huh. I went on a trip with a group of people to uh, um, Burgundy. We stayed in a town called Bonn, and I can tell you that I learned. So I learned, I didn't, so one, one night after we'd tasted some incredible wines, I didn't really understand this, this guy and I, we ordered a wine that was about two or $3,000 for the bottle. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, here goes nothing. And uh, I'm going to do this once so I can have the experience. And, you know, so, so for, the, for those who are listening, who may be interested, so it was from the DRC, Domaine de la Romane Conti, and the name of the wine is La Tache. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of had a quasi-religious experience. Come on. Really? I was really surprised because I really yeah. thought, here goes nothing. And so, and then I want to talk about food that one can get there. So, um, so this wine has sort of like, you know, you have the kind of that, the, the aromas that come up yeah. and the legs that form on the wine. But this was a really, really sort of complex smells that brought back rushes of memory. You know, you know how we smell of cut grass? Oh, yeah. Of course. So I'm getting a kind of a complex set of memories that are coming back to me. I'm getting associations from what's going on with this wine. And there's, there's, it's an incredible taste, but really it was that the, the combination of what I was smelling and the associations that were brought up for me, which was really extraordinarily special, and I really did not expect it. And the way I describe that, just going to wine for a second, is that you know, um, that's like being at the top of the mountain and seeing the incredible view. And we don't have to be at the top of the mountain all the time. It's nice to know what that view looks like. Yeah. There are many different views one can get lower down on the mountain. And then there are things that just don't have a view. But I, I knew, know what that view is like. And I've never tasted a wine like that since it's been one time. But, but I would tell you that in Bonn, there's a restaurant that my wife and I go to. And they serve these incredible wines. And the food is like, you know, steak steak frites, steak and chips and salad and foie gras and sort of simple dishes. But my God, it is really, really good. And I think that there's a whole bunch of pretentiousness that, go, pretentiousness that goes into high-end food for people who don't actually know. The uh, people who really know are all eating in bone. And I want you to encourage you and your fiancé to go. Oh, you, might you might have to encourage her. Yeah. You we'll might, do, you we'll might change it. your mind. You might, maybe you're right. I just, you know, and by the way, it's, it's a, I don't know how to describe it because it's, my joke is I'm going to spend $2,000 on this meal for five people and I'm going to shit it out in about three hours. Like That's my comment. And you know what I do? You know what I do? I think to myself that $2,000 could have gone to the watch that I want. So, so let me – so, you know, every, sort of, so this has been a learning curve for me on luxury goods. So we all understand that a Ferrari is not actually – it's an experience. You're yeah. buying an experience. And, you know, so I don't know how well – so they, they, they came out with the SP1, SP2. I don't know if you, you know those models. No. Nah. 
I mean, you, you bring it up on yeah, your I'm phone. Yeah, I'm bring it's it up like right now. The most, uh, Ferrari SP2 is, is like, this is such an iconic shape. And I don't know if this is a video, maybe you can bring up the shape. Yeah, they'll, they'll like, get it in. Oh, I've seen this car. Yep. Okay. Let me see, which one is it? It's oh, yeah. super long okay. front. This, this, just let me Batman, make sure that we're Batman looking at the same look. thing. Exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, so this thing is like three million dollars. Yeah. I don't know, ridiculous. And I imagine I said to myself, you know, I, I, I wrote to my friends. I wrote to Marsh. I said I finally found a Ferrari that I can understand because, like, it's not even trying to make sense. Yeah. And I asked myself, <laughs> it's a beautiful car. But, but I asked myself, you know, if I had that in the mountains, and once every month I took a friend out for a spin, you know. Never forget that experience right, because right. this car, for people who are not watching the video and haven't seen the photograph, it doesn't have a windscreen. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like an insane yeah, design. So is. that is totally about the experience. So um, so why do you do the $2,000 meal? It's certainly not for the experience of, of it, it leaving your body, but you're creating memories. Of course. You're creating extraordinary memories. And so you want to and, – and the wine – in a way, he decorates the table. Can your can your wife carry another handbag? Yeah, but she's got a Birkin bag. You've created a memory. I will say that is one long, long time ago. I always wanted to be wealthy because I wanted to share it with people. And one of my favorite things to do is we go on a golf trip every year, mm -hmm. and we always bring in one new person, and we we go there on a private jet just because we go to these remote places where it's Take tough photographs, to get. Take photographs. And I love seeing the person's first time on a private jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> they're either like all over the place or they're sitting there so quiet and they don't know what to do, but I absolutely love it's it. A, it's a beautiful, beautiful And it's fun thing. to share that. So I want to tell you, so the Birkin bag, when is it arriving? Um, so it's supposed <laughs> to arrive by now. So I texted the guy okay. and it's coming. I don't know when it's coming, but it's, it's, it's which, she picked out everything. Which, which shop are you picking it up from? Not here. It's in Cleveland. Okay. And, uh, I'm just curious. We're going to do some, like, I think this is relationship therapy because I think I've gone up a learning curve recently. So, um, so is it a particular event, you know, birthday, something? No. So, so here's what, <laughs> so here's what I urge you to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Your wife likes nice food. Yeah. So you're going to pick one of her favorite restaurants. Oh, there you go. And yeah. do it there. Well, you know, and so what? So maybe stop telling you. So I, I realized this and I learned this from studying the luxury goods space. And I don't, other than Ferrari, I don't know. I'm kind of looking at LVMH and yeah. I'm looking at uh, Hermes. And I'm even looking at a company that's family controlled called Piquadro, but I don't think that's the, the right thing. They make bags. And so, uh, so I went, so I love. My wife and I love this collection from Van Cleef and Arpels called mm -hmm. the Alhambra Collection. It's beautiful. But I wanted to buy something. It's like 20 years of being married, 45th birthday. And uh, so we went to Graf and I picked something out. But then I, so, so what am I trying to say? It's the experience and it's the memories and the stories we create around the experience. Yeah. So, so I find yeah. myself in your shoes. I actually looked at getting my wife a Birkin bag. And what I figured out is that the Birkin bag just doesn't work for the kind of person my wife is. Mm. She wouldn't, it's not yeah. the kind of bag that she carries. So, but with this piece of, it was a necklace, um, to, to give it to her in the right, with the right wines on the yeah. table, yeah. in the right restaurant, with the right view, and the personally written note, and now there's the, the, there's the story. And this is what I realized the luxury brands do. So why do we love Ferrari or the people who love Ferrari? Why do they love Ferrari? It's the stories around the brand. It's the races that were won, the races that were lost, the stories around the driver. Yeah. It's this century-long story that continues to unfold. But if you're not a good storyteller, if you're the brand manager, you can't tell good stories, you don't have much. Right. And, and you can do that in your own life. By the way, yeah. that's a very valid point because I, you know, I never thought of it that way, but the single largest item in our budget is travel. And that's something that 15 years ago, I never traveled. But now we look forward to our family trip every single year. We take our kids. We take yeah. all this up because it's that memory of like, yeah. we did this. Great memories. And you know, they can never steal the memories away from no, you. The memories can't. are forever. And I have a good friend who was a college classmate of mine. She's now a quadriplegic. Oh, uh, very tragic. Jeez. We don't even know what the accident was. Wow. She cannot. She 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 can breathe autonomously. She cannot use her arms or her, and her legs, and that's a possibility for all of us. Yeah. Well, my we well, my fiance just lost her sister to cancer in March, and yeah. for me, I think that was a big reason why I started to like. You know, it was like the travel thing. It's like you know, she says to me all the time, she's like, "Well, look what happened to Rita." Like, 
we don't know how long we're going to be around. Yeah. I mean, she was only 59 at the time and it's like, you sit there and say, you know, and and it's not, again, it's, we're not trying to get too depressing here, but this is what I mean about like the shift in 15 years ago to now, Yeah, you know, my my mindset, like, you know, before it had been, there's no way I'm buying that bag for you. No chance. Now it's a, you know, she values this, but then I see her with clothing and she shops at TJ Maxx for clothing. She shops at Nordstrom Rack and off fifth, but her thing is the bags. And I love yeah. them. And I actually do love them. And the trips. We take yeah. the trips and she, she gets into them. She loves them. And the best part is she lets me plan them. So I don't have to wait for her to plan them. But <laughs> You wouldn't be going on trips. We would so, not be going on I, trips if she had to plan them. I want to give you an idea on trips that I think works. Although my wife is on to me and now she will let me do it a lot less. So we know that it's the contrast that makes us really appreciate the good stuff. So if we're super hungry, we're more likely to enjoy the meal. Mm-hmm. And so I, on the early trips that we did, I mixed first class travel with third class travel. So there's a famous story, and this is on a video. <laughs> this is on a video online. It's it's a it's not a particularly well edited video, but uh, it's like it's like sort of, I don't know something Paul James effect, like just photographs moving. This was like I created this more than ten years ago. But uh, so we we flew business to India, stayed at the Imperial Hotel in Delhi, which is a beautiful mm-hmm. from like raw, and then we had them take us in the hotel limousine to the train station where we took a second class carriage from delhi to agra wow. and uh, the photographs of the transition wow. and, then, and then nagra we were in a medium hotel and then we got back into a good hotel but the contrast was really fun yeah and if you can convince your wife to do that maybe because you know what's so great about her she really is so appreciative she might be caught off guard so we just came back from we just came from Aruba. We were in Aruba right before yeah. this. We came yeah. we, we cut our trip short by a day just for Guy Spear to be here. <laughs> God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's okay. We could have been in Aruba, you know. We, I'll French, be honest, or, French or Dutch side? Uh, Dutch side. Dutch, Dutch side. Okay. We we rented a house and the house was very disappointed in me. Yeah. I didn't tell the kids. It was afterwards, and you know what her first reaction was? She calls it PG. PG. We're here with the kids. This is a beautiful house. It's a beautiful view. And it was like nice that she said that because I was the one being a brat going, this is not the house I rented. I remember texting Mo and my brother. Is this and one saying, of these Airbnbs? Or no, no, no. It was uh, full rental VRBOs and the pictures were a little misleading. But the point yeah, is like a little she, she trusts me on those things. And she'll, she, she generally 100% trusts me on the travel because she knows I, I want to travel in a good way. But the idea of mixing it. What do you think, Mo? I would do it. <laughs> I would do so, it. Another story. So I would do it. Now we're on a we're on a safari, and we're. In, I always get it wrong. Where I believe it's 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 one of the. I can't believe I can't remember the name of the city. It's the capital of Tanzania, and it's either Addis Ababa or it's uh, and I. It's Not Djibouti. Anyway, we're there. What is the capital of Tanzania? Dodoma. What was it? Dodoma. What is the capital of Manzanillo? Tanzania. Tanzania. Oh, sorry. Manzanillo. <laughs> What is the capital of Manzanillo? Tanzania. Not Manzanillo. <laughs> Bro, are you okay? <laughs> what? I'm reading this thing about Jim Harbaugh. He just got suspended. <laughs> and um, so this is the kind of place where you don't feel comfortable walking down the street. You kind of like you want to oh, take really? a taxi. Yeah. Why? So, so I want to go. There's a local market. I want to go to the local market. I insist we're going to go. So we got the hotel car and we go to the local market. And our children, they know better than their parents. They just, of course. Because this is this sort of like, okay, we go, we're going to go see some local color. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're the only light-skinned people for miles around. And we start walking through the market. And we become the main, the main attraction in the market. So, <laughs> wow. so within a few minutes, we got a crowd, a yeah. small crowd of like more than five or six people following us. And so it's really uncomfortable because you're not actually – you're not actually there. Exactly. You're just becoming the object of attention. Right. And then we turn a corner, and this is a kind of like in part of food market. We turn a corner, there's like some kind of dried fish. So people actually buy this and eat it. It is a stench. I mean, it's like just a <laughs> wave hits mm-hmm. us. And my wife just goes, I'm done. I'm going back to the car. It's like 10 minutes into yeah. it. And uh, that was the end of me doing uh, alternating between um, between luxury and non. Oh, so you don't I even do that say, anymore? Well, you, no, I would do it, but my wife is like, "You're doing that for her." So, and I do you. think that there's something to be said for it. It makes you appreciate the, of course, because certainly. I, so this is this. If people hear this, it's not going to sound that great. But we went to and we stayed at the Adair Manor in Ireland, yeah. in Limerick, and it was 
literally the most beautiful place I've ever been. Really? It was. Have you heard of it? You want to talk about no, service but... and everything was. It was better than the Four Seasons. Wow. Then we went and stayed at the K Club in near Dublin. It's I a, think I've been there. It's beautiful. Actually. It's but it's not to the level of. Yeah. And and we went. We should have went in reverse. But it made us appreciate, and now yes. I can't wait to go back so, to a dare manor. Yeah, and when, when did we do? Um, so we went to we did uh, we went to Beijing, we went uh, Beijing and Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and I insisted with my wife that we do Hong Kong after Beijing because Beijing is a tough place to be yeah. somebody who doesn't speak Chinese, right. and Hong Kong is way way easier. Yeah. So there's a kind of uh, and look, I I like swimming, cold water swimming. It's not that I like being in the cold water. It's just I like the feeling afterwards. So yeah. I'm willing to kind of do... Sacrifice it to get yeah, there. Exactly. Do you guys travel a lot? You go once... You know, how often do you guys you travel? You seem to travel a lot based on your so Instagram and whatnot. I move around a lot myself because yeah. I don't want to give up. Having moved to Switzerland, I don't want to give up being in the United States, right. attending a conference in St. Louis, uh, being in London. So I travel a lot for, I guess you can call it work. What's And now I have a daughter who's... a college here so oh. i we to visit her we need to fly over the atlantic she in she college? New York? She's, a, she's a barnard and oh. um so uh but family travel so you know there's the teenager and early teens is maybe okay but then the shit hits the fan <laughs> and good luck planning anything uh, it's just really hard because they have their own agendas. It's good. I mean, it's not hard. It's great. They yeah. have their own agendas. They yeah. don't want to hang out with their parents, you know. You know, that's a good like, the thing with Lisa. You know, her kids are 34, 30, 25. They all have significant others. Two are married. One's dating. And it's like, you know, it's past the age of worrying about are we spoiling them? And, you know, they, they look forward to the trip. And it's but that's the thing. I, my brother's got two kids, one on the way. And. I joke with them and say, I'm going to be able to enjoy life a lot more than you're going to be able to because he has a fear of, he and his wife have a fear of, are they going to grow up too closed yeah. in on these on this world of what real living is like and things like that. And it's like, it's a real, it's a reality. And I joke with my fiance all the time and I say, um, I was like, you know, we can't have a kid because I, well, first <laughs> off, scientifically, we cannot have a kid. But, you know, I sit there and say, I, I, w- I don't want to make these sacrifices. I think I'd be the diva saying, I don't want to do that. Like, you know, it's a, it's, it's just this life that, we now have, and but the thing is, it's this appreciation of saying like, okay, if we're gonna do it, you know, one of the things I did differently now, talk about luxury, because you know, I look at like look at um, LVMH, you know, Louis Vuitton, you look at Hermes, you look at all these high end luxury brands. During economic downturns, they're not happened. touched. Yeah, th- like you said, Ferrari want to sell a hundred thousand cars a year. They could do it right now. Could, yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. I look at that and think to myself, now that's the experience I'm doing with my own personal life. Like, if we're not going to do it the way we want to do it, then we're just not going to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to half-ass this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, it's these, these are the things that I, that I think that's a thing that over time, the shift, and I always wonder to myself, you know, when I'm 57, 15 years from now, what are the differences that I'm going to think about in terms of how I think about living my life versus how I do it 42? I don't know. And because yeah. I look at 27 versus 42 and it's a night and day difference that I never would have thought. I would have actually been, I would have been disappointed in my 42 year old version if I went back to 27 and said, "This is you at 42." And now I look at myself at 27 and think, <laughs> <laughs> "What was I thinking?" And those are those are those are that's the progress that's made in life. That's the things that happen. And that's why when I look at investing, it's that's why I love investing so much. It's a microcosm of your entire life. I think that you know I I struggle with LVMH because. Um, so what I can understand is that, and it makes sense if I'm somebody who works in a professional job, maybe I'm a a lawyer and I can buy that two week vacation somewhere and have a great time, Mm -hmm. or I can go and buy that handbag and that handbag stays with me for life. And it's a kind of like a reflection of my success that I have the disposable income to buy it. And, and the memory is great, but the handbag's pretty freaking good as well. I just, in, in the case of LVMH, is this mass luxury because they sell so many of those bags and so many of those. I mean, how many people, at what point does somebody look at the Louis Vuitton toile, the sort of like the pattern, they just go, yeah. that is so tacky, you know? And, and not, they haven't yet, but. No. They and you know, they do, but they do a good job. Like Hermes does a they, great job of saying, and, we're going to limit this thing. Yeah. Hermes is in a, is is in a different class. It's amazing, isn't it? And they, it's my favorite. And they do it's a good. They do a good brand. job. Like the exclusive, like 
Patek is one of the best to oh. me. So not, Rolex not, does a million watches a year. Patek does 60,000. It's not yeah. only the exclusivity of it with them, though. It's the generational watch, the idea that they've you're, created around that it. That was their advertising. Like, that is cr- but Anybody could have done that. You're entering into a different world. You are. Yeah. You're building your and legacy. They've, and they've created that world. The, the watch inspires – well, I don't know because I don't own one. But the watch inspires you to build a legacy. It yeah. says you're entering because into a – you want to pass it down. Hey, give me your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to get this over and done with here. You know, because I, I, I look at it, you know, it's like you said. He's it's pulling out his card. You're going to pull it. If you give it to me, I'm buying it. <laughs> if you give it to me, I'm buying it. We have the same card. No way. We have all the same card. Okay, here we go. Ready? What if I bought it for you right now with your credit card? You have to call the credit You have to call Amex and say, hey, listen. Like, I'll, I'll blame it. I'll when my wife. Yes, the exactly. Card, like, listen, this guy did it in New York. I did it. <laughs> All right, I'm memorizing the number. Memorize the number. Memorize the number. <laughs> no, but you know, I you know, I think about it. I think about these things because I think about just. I, I don't. I always joke and say I went through a midlife crisis when I was 25 or 30. Like I don't go through this stuff now because of you know there's other risks in life, but these are all the things that all work together in. It, it's it, the, the 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 limited supply of these luxury goods. How's it any different than time? And I'm not meaning that to be all like all philosophical and like, oh, I'm in a po- poetry session. No, I mean, really mean it. Like our time, when you, especially when you have money, the only thing you, the only thing you don't have extra of is time. As cliche as that is. The only thing is, you can't achieve is more time. Yes. Yeah. As cliche as that is. I've given Chantal instructions to get me more time. She hasn't succeeded yet. <laughs> yes, exactly. And by the way, you know what the funny part is? I sleep more now than I did back in the day, yet I value time more because now I realize when I sleep more, I am much better off during the day and I enjoy that time much more. Yeah. And the same thing with the same thing with the bags, same thing with the watches, same thing with everything we do in life. But the one thing that I'm different about is I don't look at the stuff I buy as this is the status for me. I, I hope I like don't look it. at that. I hope I don't look at that. I look yeah. at that like um, like the house we have. The house we have is actually bigger than we wanted. I actually wanted a house about half the size of the one I built that I sold to him. But this situation, it marked every single box except for that. And it was, everything else was perfect. And I remember, and at least I in the house now, and we just go, this is too big for us. But it was exact. And I look at this house going, I will be in this house till the day I die, I hope. Because I just love it so much. You know what I mean? And I know these are the things that, that matter. To, it's just like it's doing now. It's not a matter of doing, owning a lot of things. It's about owning the things that I really, really value and saying, these are the things I'm going to own. And that's like you said about the companies. I'm just going to own these amazing companies and that's it. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of um, what, what you're saying. And it, this may feel like a leap to you, but it's not for me. I'm thinking of, um, uh, so two people, and I think it's okay to mention their names, Andrew Wilkinson and Chris Sparling. They started this company called Tiny Capital. It's now publicly traded. I haven't followed it, but uh, Andrew was, ran a design agency that designed a number of kind of really famous apps. Like there were, you know, this is kind of design, but it inter- user interfaces and usability. So interfaces into the software. So the Slack, the design of Slack and the way it works was he had something to do with it. Wow. His design agency had something to do with it. And then they went and ended up uh, allocating capital into these kind of internet businesses that may not be Microsoft or Apple, but they kind of like cash flow generating businesses Mm -hmm. where they generate 1 million, 3 million, 5 million cash flow. And, and, you know, once you've got a subscriber base, it's kind of really fascinating businesses. I probably ought to look more at them, but I remember meeting them and they, so, so Chris, who's the CFO would talk about how to design your perfect day. And they live in Victoria in Canada. So this is like sort of, it's not even Vancouver. This right. is like an hour away from Vancouver. And it's a beautiful, lovely place, a simple place to live. And he talks about designing his ideal day and what are the contents of that ideal day. And they're extraordinarily successful. And what comes up for me, and I think that you've got it, Paul, is um, somehow if, you, if, if you're in the right groove, and I don't know what things need to come together for this, but you, you're kind of like you're... What what Paul is doing is he's allocating his energies really really well. He's having, you're having I fun. I am but, having fun. But you're allocating your energies in a way that you're extraordinarily productive without even noticing it. And I think just going back to the guy who's like, when you're saying in front of the classes, don't chase the money. Maybe another way. And I know I'm kind of not quite making the case, but I kind of feel like I'm reaching over the horizon for this. Is um, you need to do things that you love because it's only when you do things that you love that you will 
really allocate your energies yeah. into it that's in true. a way that's productive. And you yeah. seem to be doing that. Well, and that's, you know, it's funny because I, um, whenever I want to pick up a hobby, I'm very quick to say, if this doesn't stick, I'm okay with that. Cause I look at chess to bring it right back to chess. Yeah. The fact, the fact that April 15, 2016 is a day I know is the first day I joined chess.com. That my first lesson ever with my instructor. And since then I missed one day of chess. Wow. Like to me, that just says, wow. yeah, but, but to oh me, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't brag about that as look how obsessed I am. I brag mm. about that as look at, look at how much it affected my life that I sat there and said, this is it for me. Yeah. Like chess is the thing for me, yeah. you know? And I look at that thinking to myself, like, that is awesome to me. Like to, to me, that is what, that to me is what, like, look at investing in money and thinking about investing. That's an everyday thing. I don't, I don't walk. I mean, now obviously I can compartmentalize it when I'm doing, but I look at that saying, that's me. There's never ever a question of, is this going to be my but future not, or not? You're not forcing yourself. No, zero. But now you talked about guitar. Yes. Do you play? So, uh, so my, you know, it's going to sound like the chess story. So I played in a band in high school. Okay. I had a friend, I have a friend, I haven't seen him much, but he's still a friend uh, who's very talented. Mm -hmm. And he ended up doing... He was he did he did the natural sciences program at Cambridge, which was kind of a pretty hard program to get into, but he's a really talented musician. I was not a talented musician. At some point, we we he wrote a song that I had to play the solo guitar for. He wrote my solo because I wasn't going to do a very good solo. And I ended up learning classical guitar. And oh, which it, is harder. Uh, that is harder. Uh well, I have no natural ability or talent, Neither but what I. I can do is sit and and, and do exercises and improve yeah. my technical ability. And I did it for a while. And then I just stopped playing. Ah. And um, so, you know, I watch on YouTube, I watch this guy called Paul Davids, who's a Dutch guy. Okay. He's a very, very talented, beautiful, beautiful. It's really fun watching his videos, but no, I don't play anymore. Mm. And Do I'm you play curious. Anymore? So now that we're moving, I, I have play. all my guitars are packed away. Ah, Are you, that's right. Do we need to talk about which ones? What do you mean? Anything uh, so, cool? So guitars, electric. Oh, no. It's, I have two acoustic and like six or seven. But again, I don't buy expensive guitars. I just buy pretty ones. You know, ones that... So, but I need to... I'm just curious to know what shapes. So. What do you mean what shapes? So I don't know which guitars that was Stratocaster. Oh, yes. It? No, it's like... Um, what are the ones I have? I, I don't know. I have a Gibson. I have, acoustic, I have an Epiphone. I have... I have that's what I like. Yeah, I don't even... That's the thing. I'm such a... To me, guitar is purely for... I love that song. Let me see if I can play it. I'm not a, like, even if you said to me, like, Paul play, you know, I, I don't, I don't read, I don't read sheet music. It's purely the guy I follow on YouTube is Marty music. I do it purely for the fun of, yeah, well, that's great. I love that. Yeah. Song. But that's the yeah. thing. The thing I've learned in life is that I have to do it in a way that's fun for me. Like my chess instructor, he'll come up with an idea for a way for me to learn more. And one in three or four of them work because the other two or three, I'd be like, I don't want to do that. But then there'll be something I go, this is it. Let's go focus. I do believe that you're going to get better at things you when like you them. do them in a way that you also not only it like them, you. but you got to do them in a way that also you enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's this managing your energy. Yes. But lore is a, somebody lore is, there's a book about, it's about managing your energies and you kind of. I've never even heard of that before. I, the, the last name is Laura. Can we, can we look it up? Yeah, L-O-E-H-R, I think, and energy, and that should, should come up. On Amazon? So it's, I just so, saw the word E-N-G. It's, it's went, a, it's went a, back here. www.google.com. In, in the world of, <laughs> look, the world of self-help, which is trying to give you all these tricks e and tips for being more successful, get more friends, get more time, get more. He kind of, it's just interesting innovation, as he says. Manage your energies, mm -hmm. and then I, you know, I brought up the guys at Tiny, and I can, I'm getting to know you, and I, it seems like you manage your energies well. I, listen, I, I, I just, I, I hope so. I think it's very flattering for you to say that. I just, I don't know. To me, I, I, I only said it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. No, but I think to myself, I used to live this life of everybody. You know, like the comment I made earlier when I said these smart people are just as dumb as me. Yeah. It was meant to say that I grew up revering all these people who were successful and thinking they were flawless. Yeah. And then when you grow up and realize, you know, when you, when you were younger, you thought everybody who was 35 or above was so smart. And the first thing I teach the high school class is, guys, I'm going to teach you my perspective. I could be 100% wrong on this thing. And there are things, that, because the whole point is, the way I do it for me is not the way it's going to work for everybody, like yeah. you were talking about earlier. Before you enter the forest and the, where mm -hmm. there is no path. You know, I, I and and it's beautiful that you're kind of saying, look, you think these people are flawless, they're not. Yeah, yeah I'm not flawless, and there's certainly 
just go back to the book for a second. There's a big part of my book that I wanted to show that. And too many people, you kind of want to go to these people, and it's a bias in all of these business biographies. But the last one of the ones that I read recently is um, the super agent who started Creative Artist Agency. Ovitz, Michael Ovitz. Oh, Michael Ovitz. That's yeah, right. That was yeah. the one. That was so the one I was like, talking my, about last my night. My Michael Ovitz. And the thing is, you read the book and you know that there's so many skeletons in the closet yeah. that he's not just, bring, just not bringing out. And you want to go to them, actually in his case, because if he actually wrote about the skeletons, there'd be twenty. There would be yeah. a crowd of 20 people with pitchforks ready to... You know to, there's something there. He'd sell a lot of books, though. But... Um, uh, yours, was, so, your, yours was a vulnerable book. Yeah, so, so, so you want to go to them and say, look, you know, are you really, is this really about aggrandizing your ego? Don't you want to be about showing the next generation yeah. that you're a human? There's that mistakes you're not made. That, that's the thing. Yeah. I always said to people, I want to write a book someday and call it What I Screwed Up. Because I just felt like people wanted to put themselves on a pedestal and talk about all the great things they did. And if you're around long enough, you're going to do great <clears throat> things. You're going to, do, you're going to be yeah. right. And the question is, when you're wrong, how wrong are you? Yeah. And how did you react? And, and how, how did you, you react? And so I was at this investment conference, and, and you know, it gave me an insight. So I have this thing, this investment conference that I have called Value X, and, and it's like I, I now need to turn that ship around. because So people, they, people talk about stock ideas. And then there's questions. Mm -hmm. and, but there's a kind of like you're, you're saying, hey, look how smart I am. I've got this great idea. And then people pick it. But what happened at this conference was there was a slightly different focus, which I've been talking to my staff about, which was not so much prove how smart you are by sharing us an amazing idea with us, rather than bring us your most difficult, thorny investment problem and lay it out for us. And then a whole bunch of us are going to help you think through it. Put it together. And so... The, the, you know, if, if you start off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the story of my life, but here are three, before I tell you, here are the three big unanswered questions, or here are the big, so, so something that forces you to come from a place of humility, rather than coming from a place of, look how great I am, right. you know? Right. Well, and that's the so. thing, the investment world is very, everybody wants to sound smart in the investment world, and I am truly of the belief, and, you know, one of, our, one of the guys who taught us about value investing, he always used to say to me, Paul, dig deeper. And I've started to realize more and more, no, I'm not going to dig deeper. <laughs> no, guy, but here's why. Because I felt to myself, why do I need to dig deeper? I looked at real estate. And I, and I remember when I first got into real estate, people showing me all these Excel sheets. Yeah. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to brag. Yeah. My real estate track record is phenomenal. Yeah. And I literally look at it the way I look at if it can't be done on literally an Excel sheet in one, I just look at it saying, listen, at the end of the day, I'm looking at revenue, I'm looking at profit. How do I drive revenue? How do I drive more profit? If the answer is there, but instead it's, well, if I depreciate this, this fat, I'm like, no, you're using tricks. I look at the same thing for stock investing. Yeah. At the end of the day, every investment's a present value of all future cash flow. Can I, I always tell on the channel and tell me, I, by the way, guy, this is where I want you to go, Paul. No. I say three things. One, do I think the company will be around for the foreseeable future? Yeah. Whatever that may be. The answer is yes, I go to number two. Yeah. Do I think I can reasonably assess how much money they're going to make in that foreseeable future? Yeah. And if the answer that's yes, three, can I pay a reasonable price today that gives me yeah. an adequate return on that capital? As simple as that sounds, I think to myself, why do I need any more? Yeah. Am I wrong? I don't know. I just look at it saying, why do no. I need any more? Why do I need to sit there and say, well, Paul, if you look at their this and that and the other and their ROI. It's just like, okay, great. And by the way, I do think ROIC is important. I do think these aspects are important. But I think that in the world of investing, people really try hard to overcomplicate as a justification to yeah. make sound smarter for what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, well, my father would put it even better. I think he'd say, look, it's very, now he's not in investing. He'd say, it's very simple. He says, I buy for two, I add 2%, and sell for four, and somehow it works. <laughs> 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 but seriously, that's, but that's, but that's, but you know, as, as funny Something as that like is, that. Yeah, yeah. But as funny as that is, it's true. And I look at that saying, yeah. like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't like the overcomplication of life and business and investing. And for some reason, I just get so distracted by all the, I get so annoyed. This is the contrarian in me that says, if all these people are so worried about this aspect of the company, I'm not. 
Or, you know, I love this idea of if you, if, if you keep asking the question, then it's probably the wrong idea. If you keep trying, you know, so, so somebody who says, oh, that's a great idea. I need to spend some time feeling, getting comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. You have to freaking get comfortable with it. It's probably the wrong idea. It needs to hit you over the head. You're going yeah, to force yourself into that comfort zone. No, I, I would tell you, I'll give you an example because it's just been, um, uh, it's been on my mind a lot. <clears throat> so... Um, so, so the investor ideas come in all sorts of shapes and forms. Uh, I can tell you all the reasons why uh, it probably makes an awful lot of sense to own some of the some coal miners here in the United States. And there's an unusual confluence of circumstances that have come about to create extraordinarily profitable companies that nobody else can invest in mm-hmm. that are very, very cheap that are repurchasing all their shares. It's ridiculous. But there is an out. There's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a remote risk. There's a, there's a risk that the, they succeed in treating it like the tobacco industry yeah. and yeah. they kind of like hammer them, right? You know? And so, I, so, you know, is it a, so I've taken the decision. I'm, I'm, so far, I haven't played in it. Why can't you put a little bit in there? So, yes, but, but you know, that, uses, that colonizes a piece of my mind. And now, now, it's, you uh, know, now uh, I start yeah. having too many investments. And you know, I don't want to have that many investments. So, so do, you know, and that's the thing for me. If I felt that about something, I'm, I'm assuming I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I look at it saying, okay, let me put a half percent or one percent in the portfolio. Something where I just sit there and say, if this goes to zero, you know, so, so I have a new belief now that I'm going to be looking for the 100 baggers. Yeah. When I say this, what I mean is I'm looking for sub $1 billion companies that have X attributes and I put a very little amount of money in. But my goal is, to guy, go 100X. Mm. and my goal is I will buy it and never think about it again. If it goes yeah. to zero, it goes to zero. I don't yeah. care. If it goes, if, if, if two out of 20 go to 100X, I've done yeah. pretty well. And it's like, it's like pl- you plant a new vineyard every year. Some vintages yeah. are going to be good. Some yeah. are going to be bad. But the good vintages are going to take care of the lot. But the right. thing is, it's even right. better than that because I don't have to pay attention to the vineyard anymore. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting there saying, I want to put a small enough amount of money in where if it went to zero, I wouldn't care. Yeah. But if it go, grows 100, I'm you going to be fine. very, very happy I did it. Yeah. That's the whole tin can idea. That, yeah. I, that That's the yeah. whole idea of saying this coffee can. Like, hey, listen. But the other thing is that, though, it makes me a lot more, let me make sure I really understand this going into it. Because I don't want to just throw a dart and say, oh, that sounds like a good company. It's the whole long runway with a high ROIC with all these, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. All these things that come together. So when I pull the trigger, I'm only trying to pull one a year. Yeah. And then it's, it's really tough. I mean, if I look back over the sure. last four or five years, Apple, I mean, I, I can tell you a painful story for me about Apple. This is around 2005, six, a guy that I highly respect at the Berkshire meeting. He says, he talk, he, I say, so what have you been buying? He said, you know, I've been buying this company, Apple. And he says, this is like 2006, he mm-hmm. says. It's pre-iPhone. Um, yeah. He says, you know, they, Apple are really good with images and videos, and Windows computers are kind of good with Excel and word processing, but not for all those things. And, you know, it seems to be the world is going that direction. That was a simple insight. And, and people are going to want computers that manipulate images. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and you can, I mean, I don't know how many times it's gone up since 2006. And I was there, and I had this stupid idea. I don't buy tech. You know, mm. How ridiculous. I've changed my mind on that. But, but for every Apple and for every Amazon, there's how many that didn't become that. You know, and, and, and things like I, you know, I remember looking at Carvana. Yeah. And, and you know, the Carvana was this amazing idea that made the people who didn't buy it feel really dumb. Yeah. You know, and I felt really dumb. And I remember looking at Roku and feeling really dumb. You know, and I, I looked at it and thought, oh, my God, these guys are going to dominate this uh, TV space. Mm. And then I'd look at the valuation. I'd say, well, I'm just not smart enough to understand yeah. this valuation. Yeah. But, for, so, so, but your point is, yeah, you'll make, you could not try not to make those mistakes. But if you do, it's okay because next year you're going to do another one. See, you and know? I'll tell you right now, to the day I die, I go back to look at the numbers of Carvana. It doesn't bother me one bit that I missed it. I look at it going, it didn't make sense to me. And you know what? The, the, for every Carvana, there's 50 that didn't work out. Yeah. I look at it going, okay. Carvana, more people lost money in Carvana. Yeah, because yeah, we, had, we even had um, our value investing friend, he, yeah. somebody that he knew bought that thing and he was living or dying with that. And it was 60% of his portfolio because it grew up, it grew so much. Yep. But then uh-huh. when it fell 90, 95%, 90, you sit there and say, listen, I don't know. So, so it, that tells me that, you know, go, going back to an earlier part of the conversation, it is really sensible to say, hey, when the thing goes, has gone up four or five times, yeah. I will take X percent off the table. Can, yeah. I re- can I correct that a little bit in yeah. what I will get? If it's X amount overvalued, I don't care if it's gone up 5X. I care yeah. if it's sitting at $100 and I think it's worth $150, I will gladly sit on it. 
But if I bought it at 10 and went to 100, I think it's worth 60. That's the hard part going, yeah. what do I do here? Because yeah. they still got runway, especially if it's good monster beverage. You know, Monster Beverage is the company over the last 20 years that has just been... Isn't it insane? Yes. At what point on Monster and Beverage would you have said, insane. you know, I just got to take money off the table? Because Especially with the runway. Because I don't had. want to compete with Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah, those exactly. are the, the big bad gorillas. Right. Well, my, yeah. th- my thesis on those would have been, when are Coca-Cola and Pepsi going to buy Monster? Which never ended up happening. I don't know. I, this is the hard part about investing... Um, is this idea of overvaluation and what do you do? You know, but at the same point, from my perspective, I, I, like I said, I go back to Charlie Munger and Costco because he speaks so re- uh, highly of Costco. And I have a hard time believing that if it was me and Charlie Munger in a room and I said, nobody's going to hear this. What do you think? I have a hard time he, him saying, there's no way he's buying more Costco. I mean, I look at the valuation of Costco saying, what has to happen for revenue growth? And I know Mona says, they, 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 we haven't even touched China. He's right. Okay, give me your all optimistic views on China for Costco. How do you still bring in the valuation where it makes no, sense? I, I'm not aware of, like, I, I know what the market cap is and what their current earnings are. So I, I'm, I, 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 every time I've looked at it, it's looked super overvalued yeah. to me. But, um, but, you know, if you had a, if you had a, a five-year-old daughter and you were gonna, knew you were going to die of cancer next year, and, and, you know, to put some of her money into Costco because, you know, over 20 or 30 years, mm. it's going to do fine. It might not be a terrible... Yeah, maybe you're, maybe you're right. I just look at it saying, well, first off, if I, I do like the Warren Buffett idea of him saying, when I die, I tell my family members, you know, S&P ETF. I do think that'll be a thing for my, my future. But, you know, I, I sit in these things and the great, the, the, the benefit I have, Guy, is I have zero FOMO. Like, I don't look at a company that goes up 10x and think, why did yeah. I get that? And part of the reason why you don't have FOMO is because you're living a fun life. And you're enjoying yeah. yourself. So I think a really important lesson for people don't like. Don't get inside right. your head if you got FOMO. Get yourself a life that is really compelling. Mm. I stopped being envious of Bill Ackman when I was living in Zurich because I was loving my life. I was going swimming every day and cycling and going up to the mountains to go skiing and commuting to work. And I knew that Bill was standing there in the garage dealing with some guy where he has to give a tip <laughs> to get into his car. I'm like, I have a better life. And so, so when I said earlier about the being the richest man in the world, and you laughed and said, I've been there. So. Please, but let's end it on this. Please tell me about that because when I tell it to people, I tell them like, listen, I'm telling you right now, when I was 25, 26, my one goal was, I remember even thinking to myself, would I be okay with top 10? I was like, no, I would not be okay with top 10. How, how ridiculous of a statement is that? Well, I'm glad you were an ambitious guy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You're just, you're just ambition, ambitious for different, more meaningful things now. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, but... You know, when you, you laughed and said, oh, I've been there. I mean, you really had the ambition of being the richest Did man you in the really? world. Not necessarily the richest man in the world, yeah. but I had ideas of being maybe a billionaire. Or yeah. being, oh, I'll be a billionaire. I, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> that will Inflation will take care and, of that, you know, just, just, just I, Listen, <laughs> at the end of the day, you know what takes care of it? Math. Yeah. I, I've yeah. done the numbers go, and that's why I stopped looking at my net worth. I'm like, if I grow 7% a year. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So I'm looking, at, I, I know my real estate deals do way better than that. My cash is doing five and a half percent. Now, I mean, I'm not worried about it, but the thing is, do I like the idea of becoming a billionaire? Just say, hey, I'm a billionaire. Yeah, sure. But at the end of the day, I know that when I'm 999 million, then check over to a billion. Am I going to feel any different? Of course not. Look, uh, <laughs> here's a, an inter- a good way to look at it. Or another way to look at it maybe is that um, I've been, so I started attending the TED conference uh, I don't know, like 15 years ago, and I don't go every year, but I go many years. It's a wonderful place to be and lots of interesting people. I'm one of the least interesting people in the room. <laughs> you know, they're, they're like, it's, oh, a, a guy who made some money, they're a dime a dozen. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not interesting for so many people in that room to talk to, or if they come to talk to me, it's just because they're hoping to get some money off me. What, so so how, how sad is that? Yeah. But imagine, you know, a guy that I've been tuned into a little bit and I'm reading a book of his David Brooks who's a journalist for the New York Times and um, you know he's like he has the most interesting conversations and so you know how many minutes do we have left in our life and and how many interesting conversations are we going to have right are we just going to be standing at a conference where other people are having interesting conversations they already come up to us right I think of people like George Orwell so George Orwell decided that he was going to write about what it was like to be with no money in Paris, and he went and lived amongst the homeless in Paris for a certain amount of time, and then wrote about it. Or, mm. you know, some people in this is you know they've they've 
they've decided to fly to Israel to go and visit these communities that have been devastated by this recent attack because they want to experience that and they want to be able to tell a story. Or I'll tell you about a guy who I'm kind of slightly envious of because he's a successful businessman, but he's also a philosopher, and now his name's gone out of my head. He's French and he's Jewish, and I can't believe that I can't remember his name. Maybe I have to look it up. But, um, you know, he's like, he went to Ukraine, and he wanted to meet Zelensky because he's also sort of pretty famous and written some yeah, books. Right. He's considered to be a philosopher. Uh, and so he's got a really interesting life, you know? Yeah. And so for, for, partly, Paul, for you, hanging out with your wife and watching TV shows is part of your interesting life. But money's not going to take care of how right. many TV shows you can watch, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not going to take care of hanging out in Ukraine and meeting some people who are going to change the future of Ukraine or being able to tell a story of atrocities or whatever else it is. Right. I find myself, you know, I think that Envy is a really fascinating guide because it shows where we might have gone because the Envy doesn't come from nowhere. The Envy says, I'm capable of that, but I just don't have it right now. And so I find myself envious of journalists who have interesting conversations. Don't find myself being envious of politicians and I don't think I'd enjoy being, say, President of the United States. That'd be but awful. But to have the right to be in those rooms when I want to be in those rooms. Yeah. So Nassim Taleb, he's, he's met with prime ministers and presidents. So that's kind yeah. of a very interesting place to right. be. So I'm envious, and I'm not kidding about this one. It's not meant to be cliche. I'm envious of people who don't care. I just think I care too much about certain things, and I don't want to. Um, no, I'm not envious. Everybody if cares they, a little bit. If they don't care something. and they don't do anything, it's like they've got to care about something. So, you know, yeah. when I say that, see, I don't agree with that. I, you know, it's funny, Guy, I've, I've really changed my outlook on these things. I look at, you know, one of the most content people I know, you know who it is, Michael. Mm -hmm. And I, I say don't care facetiously. Like literally, like you said, we got to care about something. I mean, he cares about his kids' safety and his family and all that stuff. But I look at it saying accepting what is. You know, yeah. and that's a, that's a book, that, you know, Loving What Is by a lady named Byron Katie. And it's like, man, that's a hard thing to do. You know, we, we sit there and yesterday, you know, Nick got an altercation out here on the street with somebody, you know, and, uh, you know, but I only bring that up saying... I only bring that up not to say like, but it's, it was funny because I actually wondered myself last night as I was telling Lisa the story, I'm like, I wonder what I would have done there. Like would I have got, would my ego have tempered up and where I'd said, Hey, watch it pal. Or something like that. Where I've sat there and said, you know what? Okay. We had a disagreement. Let me move on. Cause I, I have this temperamental part of me. And then I have this really calm part of me that just doesn't care about things and love saying, eh, it is what it is. But 15 years ago, it was the, you ready to go, pal? Are you ready to go? Like, you know, kind of thing. And now it's... Should we do this? Should we do this? Yeah. And, and look at me. Should I be doing... Should I be saying that to anybody in this world? No, I shouldn't. I don't know. I just... I don't really mean don't care, but the people who can just accept what is as part of it. You know, listen, even though, I'm, even though the money we run is our families, you know, just recently, my brother was getting upset about some short positions I took on calls for some, some of these, you know, Magnificent Seven stocks. And I finally told him... I'm taking 100%. He said, no, 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 no. I'm like, I'm taking 100% because to me, it was just not worth it to hear him cry and complain all the time about it. And I have no problem with it. Today, the market's up a ton. Okay, don't care. You know, mm. but 10, 15 years ago, Paul would have cared a ton. My brother still cares. Go ahead. Do you still not hedge against the market? I, don't hedge. I didn't think so. I, just I, I, read it, I read it last night as I, I was rereading. I could wake up tomorrow and find out that yep. well, me and all of our investors are worth half what we were the day before. And you're totally, good with that now. Totally fine. I'm totally yeah. fine with that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of a beauty. You know, if you get to a certain point in the compounding process yeah. and you've managed to not allow your spending to grow in yeah. line, so you, you, you want to let your spending grow at a lower rate than the rate at which your portfolio is growing. Mm -hmm. But I, I tell you an exercise that I've done not particularly well, but it's a really powerful exercise to do. It helps focus on the, perhaps on the right things, which is, what do you want your obituary to be? Yeah, I know. You don't know what it to, no, you don't want it to be? <laughs> yeah, answer, no, yeah. no, no, I say that because you're you're 100% right. Like I read that and of course I read it from, you know, I read it on Twitter from these people who are trying to be, you know, the Ferrari driving like, oh, Ferraris don't matter to me. And then their next picture is them going, hey, you like my new shirt? And there's a Ferrari logo <laughs> right there, you know. Um, you know, and that has really shaped a lot of, you know, thinking of myself about, because when I was... Well, you know, I, 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 I'll push you. It's like sort of, you talked about travel. So which places do you want to travel to oh, and how? Yeah, we, uh, we have yeah. that list and we, we love it. And 
what you know how many how many birkin bags will your wife die with you know which ones are important to you or for example i mean just out of many or uh, some people want to hold, hold a collection of certain works so i can go in a thousand different places course, yeah, you know course. and by the way that the, the hard part for me is part of this transition was saying I used to fight it saying, well, I shouldn't want these nice watches. I shouldn't want, it's like, no, it's, do they define you? It, it, like you said, if your net worth falls in half, but your process is the right process, you don't care. Yeah. I think that, um, it, it's funny because at this dinner last night, I asked everybody, the first question I said is tell the table something that you're really proud of. And mm. interestingly enough, and I wouldn't have known it. I'm really proud of my marriage. I'm proud of the relationship because, because, you know, out of, Many of us were getting married around the same time. Ours was slated by friends and family observing us to be the one that was least likely to Really? Succeed. Why is that? Yeah, we what? were fighting constantly. We're really? Like, my wife is Mexican. I'm from you know, Northern, Northern Europe, maybe you could say. Just so many differences between us and uh, so many difficulties in finding a way to get along. And um, I have this beautiful idea, which is probably a topic for yet another podcast, which I'm happy to get into, which is that it's not, it doesn't originate with me, but... It's in that fight. It's in that struggle that we actually grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to yeah. grow without the fight. Yeah. yeah. And so we, you need to learn to fight better. You need to learn, turn the fight into a dance. Right. But, but it's that struggle and that friction that creates. And, and, and we had so much friction, and so much heat and not much light that we, we regularly felt like the whole thing was going to explode. Did you, you know? guys notice at least I got in a fight last night? No. No. Okay, so that's funny because, you know, I'm very big and open to talking about therapy. I'm in yeah. therapy. I love therapy. Yeah, yeah. I've been in therapy 18 years. How many therapists? I have two. Uh, that two? I have two yeah. currently. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'll tell you a story about my wife, how my wife and I fight in a minute. This is going to be fun. So one of the first yeah. things when my, 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 my fiance and I started yeah. dating, one of the first yeah. things I said to her is we have to start seeing a couple's counselor day one. Absolutely. And, well, you say absolutely. But yeah. Everybody's like, why do you guys have problems? Yeah, I mean, what's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. No, I look at it saying, no, we have to learn. The, our biggest but thing you know, is. The, the ad for head and shoulders. The guy's using head and shoulders shampoo, which is anti-dandruff. Shampoo. The French friend says, but you don't have dandruff. Uh, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We, we, we don't fight. We didn't fight very well. But last night we were in a fight. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now that if it was three round one, because we split up for a year, round one, that fight, we'd probably still be in a fight right now. And the difference is how we fight now is yeah. totally different than how we fought. And guess what? We still have a long way to go. Yeah. But imagine That's if we weren't in couples counseling, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, uh, so, so I, I was, I've done, so in, in our life, in our family's life right now, well, we, <laughs> so we have a, a family therapist, that therapist, sometimes I see him, sometimes my wife sees him, sometimes one of our children sees him, sometimes we see him together, sometimes separately. My wife, I don't know how many therapists she has. She's very sad because the therapist of 10 years retired and then she's got a new therapist but she's also done a coaching course so some of these coaches are kind of could also be considered therapists and i had for 10 years a Jungian therapist here in new york city then i experimented a little bit with um with emdr love emdr <laughs> fuck yeah yeah emdr we love very, very emdr cool. yeah yeah so um adp a woman i knew he was gonna say emdr a second he said so, i experimented so this is and then you know i i decided one day i was like i don't want to be in a relationship with my Jungian therapist anymore I'm happy to be friends with him, but I don't want to go to weekly, monthly, whatever it was that I was doing. So I stopped. And since then, I've been in, I've had therapists on and off, but I haven't really found somebody that I want to be in. And I got, you know, we all got shit to deal with and I got plenty to learn. And so, and I I just, so here's the hazard of how some recent, not that recent, but some fights with my wife have gone, which is hilarious. So she's like, you know, if you had a therapist, so she's talking to me, I wouldn't have to deal with this garbage. You know, and I'd be like, I'd return and say, well, if you actually talk to your therapist about the things you should be talking about. <laughs> so it's like, how can you have a good fight when you can't bring the therapist into it? But I think that, the, so, I, you know, my wife said something, it rubbed me the wrong way. And then I said something, it rubbed mm-hmm. her the wrong way. But, but it, you know, we got pretty quickly to a place where it's like, okay, you know, obviously there's something here. Whenever there's friction, my orientation now is I have something to learn. Yeah. My wife, if it's my yeah. wife, also has something to learn. But I'm going to start projecting onto her what she's oh. got to learn. i got to do my homework and figure out what it is. And if I can show her that I'm doing my homework, then probably she will do hers. Mm. And uh, 
I mean, that for me is, you know, so I see Spike in a different version of my life. I'd go to my Jungian psychotherapist. He was like in the 30s on the east side here in New York. And, I, and the, un, the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. yeah. So I'd be quite envious of him because like, he's like the ferryman, Siddhartha. He's like re- meeting these people who kind of bring, opening up their guts. And he's like living with them in kind of key moments, a very meaningful life yeah. to be a therapist in a certain way. So in another version of my life, I would have enjoyed maybe studying or being a psychotherapist. But yeah, then like, so we have, there's one, so when, when we have really big fights, mm-hmm. there's a woman, she's, a, um, she's really good at kind of mediating, mediation more than kind of like how do you, Figure out your dynamics, type of deal. But yeah. So, what's a really big fight? Um, I'm getting really deep. I'm going to get really personal here. But like, what's a really deep fight? Can I tell you what a really deep fight for us would be? I mean, I, I will tell you. So, one of the most difficult, a, a one of the many most difficult times in our marriage was. Um, so, so my I we had talked about it, and uh, but I had so the, one of the kind of dynamics between my, me and my wife was everything's theoretical for me because I'm not capable of executing. Yeah. So it's all theoretical. I didn't. I was kind of talking about it in theory. My wife is extremely grounded, and so nothing is theoretical. Oh, so, I love your wife. So, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Black and white. Yeah, I'd probably get on with your wife, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you probably exactly. would. This, the, you exactly. Can, yeah. So I'm sort of saying, yeah, wouldn't it be great sometime we move to Zurich that we go and, you know, I'd love to spend six months in Israel, and, and you know, we'll go and spend six months living in Mexico. So Laurie hears that, and the next thing I know, we're moving to Mexico for six months. But, um, but it kind of, like, doesn't work for me and my business very well. Yeah. So now, now I'm kind of commuting between Zurich and Mexico. And, and you know, I could have put my foot down and said, we're not doing that. Mm-hmm. But I was really worried that to kind of crush that dream for her, which I think she would have accepted, would have created bitterness that itself could have, could have put the marriage on the line. So, so we had a really difficult period where I was commuting, like take about an hour of travel to get from Zurich to Mexico, to, to Guadalajara we yeah. were. Uh, and so that- So it, do you know Manzanillo? Manzanillo is, is the name of a place that is familiar to me. About three, three hours south of Guadalajara. Right. So we didn't drive there, but... Uh, we have two um, houses there. If you ever want to stay there, let us know. It's on us. <laughs> and my wife certainly knows Manzanillo. Oh, so she was born in Guadalajara? Uh, she No, she, her family's... Uh, she was born in North Carolina, but she's got... Oh. The, the family she loves the most is in Guadalajara, or part of the family, and... And she's got family in Monterey as well. Oh, and, nice. Yeah. And I'm thinking of San Miguel de Allende, which oh, yeah. we were in, and she loves going to Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. I don't think she pronounces it so right. Do you, have, do you have a home down there? We don't. We, it's like, you know, Rent. don't convince me to buy more real estate, please. <laughs> okay, well, like Chapala? <laughs> if my, my wife will do it, she'd be like, see? Paul wants, you to buy, <laughs> wants us to buy a home. We Go to her and say, hey, theoretically. <laughs> See what happens. Be extremely, yeah, really. be extremely happy. But so that was not, you know, that was a period that was really, really difficult for us. And I was beside myself because I couldn't really work and focus on work if out of Mexico. Mm. But, but I was kind of conflicted because I didn't want to stop her from doing it. And so I was, that was a very, very difficult time. And, and, and uh, this woman, Ronnie, uh, she she helped us kind of mediate that. I've gone I've gone to her with when I've had difficulties with employees as well. An incredible woman. So yeah. So so when yeah. you said how many therapists you have, you were you're the only person in the world who have ever asked me that question because the joke amongst our friends is Lisa will look at me and say Paul has two therapists and he's still this crazy. Like that's no, her no, joke yeah. with me. You actually have multiple therapists. Yeah, I, well, that is the only sane way to be in the world. <laughs> I, I love mean, it. And I can't wait to tell her when we're done here. Yeah, no. And um, so what I would say is that, um, and you know, you get this from reading Yuval Harari's book, uh, Sapiens. So, wow. you know, yeah, we, know we grew up, we, we evolved as humans for, for like two million years in these hunter-gatherer groups. And it's, it, it's very recently in our evolutionary history that we became pastoralists. We kept cattle and kind of like, sort mm-hmm. of like, not very good wheat and stuff. And then it's even more recent, I think maybe in the last 10,000 years or maybe even only 5,000 years that we moved into cities. But the vast majority of our genetic programming happened in these hunter-gatherer groups. In hunter-gatherer groups, we don't know exactly what happened, so I'm imagining a little bit, but it seems clear to me. That's all me, a way of saying, hey, if you're a scientist who actually knows this shit, don't, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't challenge me. Because <laughs> yeah, I don't really know. I'm, but I get to tell a story and... 
to go back to the book. It's my experience yeah, and nobody exactly. knows so I feel. I feel this. <laughs> yeah, which means I'll never get a PhD by talking yeah, like this. Because okay. to get a PhD, you have to actually show, show science. But we would, have, we would have had the mother and the father, but we would have had elders. We would have had uncles and aunts, and they would have taught us stuff. And we would have had mm-hmm. grandparents and just elderly in the, in the hunter-gatherer group who would show us stuff. And so when we're finding therapists... We're actually just going back to that. We're actually returning home to something that is profoundly embedded in our evolutionary nature. So I have no idea. And, you know, if you take the perspective of psychic therapists, there is so much healing that needs to happen in the world. And, oh, yeah. And I think that healing happens. It's like, so, so you take the uh, Israel, the, the Israel, the Middle East conflicts around yeah. Israel, however one wants to describe it. I am blown away by how little empathy there is on both sides. Oh. And I'll, I'll send you guys a video that I recorded where I kind of like went out of my way to, to, to show empathy to the other side. And I, I may have made myself po- unpopular with some Israelis because, because they're feeling, Yuval Harari in some interview at the time, he says, we, the, both sides are feeling so much pain mm-hmm. that they cannot, they don't have the space to show empathy to, to the, the other, other side. side. And, yeah. I've been in that place that's marriage. in my marriage. Yeah. I've been in that place. That's what like, causes divorce, right? At the right. end of the day, that's, right. that's the a big The bank account's empty, and you don't have space to show empathy to the other side. And you've got to start somewhere. You know, you've got to start yeah. filling that bucket. And actually, what I've learned is you want to you want, want to overflow that bucket because it would be so damaging. And, hey, we had fights um, one time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are some fights I'm not allowed to talk about. There's some of course not. Okay, so... Uh, I, two that I am allowed to talk about. So uh, in one, um, so we're, 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 we've got a rented house in Tuxedo Park, which is up here, not far from New York City, like an hour away. And, and we've got, it's just our daughter. And my wife has just had enough of me. So the classic thing would be she wants to run away. I feel abandoned. I run after her. Now she's sitting on the, on the toilet seat, with the bathroom door locked, and I'm either slamming my knocking on the door asking like me and or I'm yelling at her through the bathroom door and she's just saying get away from me and it's not, not a very good scene you know and when that happens by the way in, in especially in women but I think men as well all sorts of stress hormones are released and it can take up to two or three days for all of that to get metabolized away so my my wife decides she's going to go for a drive somewhere mm-hmm. and uh and she's going to take our daughter with her and I got abandonment issues so I come out and I see she's driving away. Now the car doors are locked and I knock on the window. And, and my luck is that she winds the window down. And uh, I don't think that I even ask her where she's going. I climb through the window. <laughs> I sit down. She, I'm the one she wants to get away from. <laughs> she's like, I don't know. I say to her, I don't know where you're going. Wherever you're going, I'm coming with you. Oh, wow. now, which is kind of like an interesting. So that, that's, uh, uh, that's kind of one aspect of a fight that we had. And there was another one that I wanted to bring <laughs> but up. That wasn't what caused the fight. Like I'm sitting there saying, you know, for Lisa and I, you know, cause you know, we're getting married now. Yeah. Right. So we have, um, the, the thing about learning about it is, you know, she was married previously for 30 years and, you know, we, we had, and then, and then I had, you know, of course I'm a psychopath and I have all these anxieties. That's, that's so a, I did EMDR uh, for, for my anxiety, I'm right? I'm a better psychopath. Are you really? Do you think you are? I don't think so. I think that we all kidding. have a little, we're all on the spectrum. So when you did EMDR, we're... did you do the finger? Did you do the pad? What, what, pads. Pads. pads yeah. See, I did the finger and it, yeah. when I say it was like, boom, like immediate, but I have all these anxieties from child. And that one, you know, listen, I have very wonderful parents, but you know, we all have issues and yeah. you know, it's funny because I realize now that we all get triggered because of past events. Yeah. Once you have that realization, yeah. it makes accepting other people's triggering a lot easier. Right. Except when it's your wife. Oh, except <laughs> when it's your wife. So, you know, but, but, here's, but here's the great part. I'll never, ex- I'll I'll never that, accept those triggers. <laughs> but you know, the thing is about that is she and I, the problem we have in our relationship is we tend to get triggered at the exact same time. Of course. So you we have- trigger each other. Well, that's the problem. Then you, uh. you literally have- this gasoline, and then all of a sudden you have this little fire, and then all of a sudden you go with get triggered, and it's like the the the, the truck of, of of gasoline coming in and just dumping on that fire, yeah. right? Yeah, and you so, get one great big explosion, and then you get the secondary explosions. I will let you guys know if you ever see Lisa and I go like this to each other. Yeah, that's when we've been in a fight. 
Because that's our that's our reach out to like just oh, to beautiful. relax. It's beautiful. like this, it's we like put the I, finger out, yeah. and then the other person grabs the other person's yeah. finger, oh. and that's our way of saying we're both being crazy here right now. We both need to relax, <laughs> right. but let's all offer the olive branch right now. Yeah. But and it, what it, happens if the olive branch is not accepted? <laughs> so that's where I get the rejection issues. Yeah, yeah. Where oh, wow. she, she doesn't knows, want it, she's like, "Fuck you with your olive branch." Yeah. I'm not she doing this. She doesn't do that. Yeah. Luckily, because I've said to her, because you know, the funny thing is, the, the joke is she's very. You know, theoretical and feelings, yeah, yeah, and I'm me. So, I'm like totally with your wife. No, I like, can't do it. I'm me, up with her. me. If this happens, what do we do here? If this happens, what do we yeah. do here? Yeah, yeah. You like my wife? It's like it's a nightmare. No, see that to me because I, I, I sit there and say to her, like, we, we, when we agreed, that was our olive branch. Yeah. I said to her, I said, listen, and I'm saying it in front of our therapist, Jill. I said, listen. I swear to God, if I do this and it gets rejected, that's probably the end of our relationship. Because that's so hard for me. Yeah, to get yeah. You've so, got abandonment issues as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, by, the way, just, by the way, you just named your therapist, Jill, whoever you are. You're doing God's work here. Oh, I always tell her all work. the time. I've Metal East peace is nothing. Oh, this, yeah, exactly. Guy, this is not a joke. I said to Jill before, what do you make? And she goes, why are you asking me? I'm like, what would it take for you to just come on my payroll? You're Lisa's, because I tell her, because Lisa's so like scatterbrained at times. Yeah. I'm like, Jill, you can be Lisa's assistant and then also provide couples counseling for us because, yeah. but it's, it's funny. I know, that's the, that's the level in the relationship with the relationship. Can we just be friends? Can we just like, <laughs> uh, no, I've literally offered her a job saying, let's yeah, just talk and all yeah. this stuff. But, I, but these are the things that like, you know, I really truly believe that we won't make it as a couple if we, if we don't have couples counseling. No, absolutely. And, and the, 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 for me, that we got it early on. Uh, so it, early on in our marriage, we had uh, imago therapy. So oh, I don't, I don't know what that is. What is so that? the book is Harvel Hendricks. I actually remember his damn name. Um, sorry, he's, he's not damned. He's a wonderful guy. <laughs> Harvel <laughs> Hendricks, Keeping the Love You Find and um, uh, Finding the Love You Want. And it's a beautiful model of how relationships work. So I would argue that, you know, this concept of active listening, so empathizing, yeah. you know, it's like, um, and, and we're getting, you know, Paul's nodding here, I and mean, this is a whole new podcast if we want to. Um, so uh, rather than trying to decide who's right or mm -hmm. trying to talk past each other, you know, what I had to learn to do was to show up to fights with my wife and put myself somewhere else and just, you know, so quick story. So I come home one day, this is early in our relationship, mm -hmm. I do the classic thing that any male would do, which is I've had a shitty day at work. So I'm like, um, I walk past my wife. She's doing something in the kitchen. I have no idea. And uh, I go and switch on the TV. You know, I, mm -hmm. I just want to chill out and typical male thing. Yep. She comes in to the, the, the TV room. She's like, I can't believe you. She's full on on me. So I do something. This was the first time I applied what we'd been learning in marital counseling, and it blew me away. So... She's full on rage, full on hurt, full on angry. How the hell can I? So I say through my gritted teeth, literally, I say, so what I want to say is, listen, I just had a shitty day at work. Who the hell are you? You've been doing nothing here all day, just waiting for a baby to come out. That's why. Right. And I've been there. I've done that. You know, so I've, I've done that like a thousand times. You know, I uh, ground, uh, groundhog day. You know, I, I know what, how that ends. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm going to try something different. So I said, but I have no empathy. I say through Greta, so what you're telling me is <laughs> when I came in and walked past you, you felt unloved. And when I went and sat down in front of the TV, you felt like I was ignoring you. And then the most incredible thing happened because she kind of, she burst into tears. This is my memory. She says, yes, that's exactly right. And the, the flood of tears and the and then suddenly everything changes in me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly I'm not pissed at her. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, she's really hurt. Yeah. And I've made a difference for her just by doing this. And that's just a kind of like learning starts to happen. And that learning how to do that is is uh, we've been at it 20 years and we're still beginners. We're way better than we ever were. Mm -hmm. Well, that's funny because you know the, one of the first, one of the issues that Lisa and I have is I use the I feel I felt this way. That's she, yeah. which is, I pat yeah. myself on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will gladly pat myself on the back. <laughs> She's still about 50 50 on that one. She'll say, You did this to me and it caused me to feel. I'm like, and I always say to her, I don't cause you to feel any way. But when no, you no, say, no, you, you've got to say, Oh my God. So when I did this, yes. I, yeah, anyway. Yep. No, you're 100%. Because <laughs> hearing you say that, yeah. Before my ego is she's not doing the process, you know. It's, it's, this, oh, yeah. you're not oh, yeah. saying because when she says, Paul, I felt hurt when you did this, I am all ears, yeah. But when she says, but she's no, 
Yes, but if she starts with, when you did this, it made me feel this way, yeah. I'm not going to listen to a single thing. <laughs> but if she says, I felt hurt when, when you did this, when you walked in the house and yeah. you ignored me, I felt, aban- I felt hurt, I felt rejected, blah, blah, I'd be like, oh man, I'm so... Because the one thing I've learned is her feeling is her feeling. She has Doesn't the right matter. to... Yeah, yeah, and she's right. Yeah, whether it's right, doesn't matter. She is right about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, that Absolutely. was the hard. That's the hardest thing for me to, to it's get. It's so through. strange because it's it, it's it's bloody hard. It's yeah. interesting for me. It's a bit like um, accounting for me, and uh, you know, I keep trying to sort of bring it back to investing. Every and now FYI, I, if I want to trigger her big, big time, I'll say, you know, it's like it works. She's like, don't compare work to our relationship. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's some no go areas, but um, so so it's interesting that you know. I mean, anybody who's done high school maths, A-level maths in the UK has got more than enough mathematical knowledge to understand accounting. But for me to understand accrual accounting, mm. to understand depreciation, is kind of weird because the, the, mathematically it's very simple. I mean, you know, don't, not doing more than adding and subtracting. But on another level, it kind of really took me a lot of time to kind of feel really comfortable and facile with it and one continues to learn. It's something It's similar with relationships in that this stuff is not hard really to describe, but to learn to do it, maybe it's like riding a bicycle. It's just, it takes a lot of time. There's one, but it's worth it. There's, there's one fight that we had, or it kind of like it was, so, so um, we've got a new coffee machine and I've gone and seemingly broken it on the first day <laughs> and I'm super pissed and upset. And now my wife comes down and there's coffee beans on the floor and they were kind of like raising the stakes. She's like, well, what the hell have you done? Have you, you know, I'm like, do you think I meant to break the coffee machine? Purpose. And she's like, well, I don't know. There are a bunch of beans on the floor. We're right. And my, our daughter is videoing us. And so there's a video of the, us raising the stakes. And then uh, my wife notices that she's being, we're being videoed. And she says to our daughter, Apagalo, turn it off. Yeah, so anyway, whatever. Lots and lots of fights. And the, so we celebrated 20 years of being married. And I read something out that I'm happy to share with you. And um, I can share it publicly if you like as well. I, I should get permission from my wife, but I think <laughs> it's okay. And because um, we already shared it with all the guests. I said, you know, I, there's, I couldn't imagine fighting with anybody else. Mm. And, and there's a couple that I know in Zurich, and to see them, they're both yin and yang. It's so beautiful because they're not in full rage fights, but they're still rubbing against each other, yeah. and that's kind of the spice. Yeah, yeah and we don't get in full rage fights anymore, but we've had some doozies. And But I look at and, you know, sometimes I feel like a failure about that. I sit there and say, like, are we just not going to make it? Is this not going to work? But then I think to myself, you know, we're both type A personalities, and we just have very different styles about how we do things. Like, I'm very much systematic about things. When this happens, what do we do here? And she's very much like, ah, we'll get to it. But, you know, then I, when you, you, you know, I think about when I'm mad at her, I go back to the times when, <laughs> when I wanted to be with her, that we weren't together because she broke up with me because I was a psychopath and things like that. And I also think about... All the, the sacrifices. The, the very nicest and best kind of psychopath. The, I mean, literally, it's a, I'm a very caring. You know what she calls me? She calls me a sour patch kid. She goes, "You're so <laughs> you're so sour on the outside, but on the inside, you're so loving and caring." And you know, there's an Israeli term for that. Israelis consider this to be sabra, which is the um, the fruit of the cactus. Oh, so there you prickly, go. Yeah, prickly on the yeah, outside, right. sweet on That's, the inside. She calls me a sour patch kid. <laughs> Listen, it, it, but the thing is, she hates it. But when I'm alone with the couples counselor, I'll say, that, "I'm like Jill." This is literally everything we do here is business. The hard part is in business, I can say to somebody, I'm done dealing with you. Yeah. I can't do that in my relationship because I do not want to be done dealing with her. So something's got to give. And in the meantime, like you said, so it's got to be me. Two thoughts, um, which are uh, going to come back to me. Um, so I don't think that my belief is, and I don't know because only, I've only been in one marriage and, and I only plan to be in one marriage, but I think that in every successful relationship, successful marriage there are multiple moments with when both people in the marriage at different times say i can't believe that in order to be married to this person i have to put up with dot 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 both both sides of the couple feel that and it can be over things that one can't even start to Mm -hmm. imagine and or and or a similar uh, idea is i cannot believe that in order to be married to this person and be happy I'm going to have to make myself into dot, dot, dot. I get excited about that part. Well, you know, I... Is, we, the first part's what scares us. Laurie and I laugh about it. So, so Laurie was... Early on in our relationship, we, Laurie was very jealous. And so, you know, once we went on a, on a group trip 
to um, to Kiev, actually Kiev, I think they so call it now, and mm -hmm. it's like it's like full of you know hot tall blondes looking <laughs> to, looking for some ticket out of there with some Western guy, and the the group is organized. And that's your what's your um, bucket list? <laughs> a trip to a nightclub. Oh boy! You know, and and I remember Laurie's comment is, you know, she she says that these women are lined up looking at us. Yeah. And she's like, my God, they're not even pretending to dance. You know, they're just <laughs> swaying sexually. And I'm, I've, I've learned that, you know, I'm just looking at the floor. I'm looking yeah, at anything, yeah. but, anything but yeah. these women. And why, why did I bring that up? There's a reason why I was bringing that up. You said two things. The one, the first one was. Yeah, so at the time, I, I was saying, I cannot believe that in, to be married to this woman, I have to make sure that I don't trigger her jealousy by looking mm -hmm. the way many all males would and that was really painful for me but we kind of and I why said, because i because it was eye candy it was fun to look you know but is that really the reason no like why was it like to me the pain of that one is as long as i'm just looking it's a, it's a it's a person it's a thing it's like if i looked at a car and said wow nice car doesn't mean yeah. i'm gonna go get that car i don't know man it, this, this is where there's no way that a woman rationalized that, that yeah, yeah that's exactly. the problem. Exactly. thank you, yeah. but thank you. The, my my wife thanks you as yeah. well <laughs> and that's exactly it but i look at it i get the fact that they're very different things but at the same point the hard part for me was i'm 42 i'd never even lived with anybody until i lived with her a year and a half ago yeah. and so it's actually been easy to live with her but my struggle has been the I get to do whatever I want, look at whomever I want, talk to whomever I want, flirt with whomever I want. If I want to do anything, I could. And now I can't even look at somebody without being in the, like, like yeah. And the answer, the answer for me was, I want to make her happy. I don't want this marriage yeah. to end. And I can't believe that in order to make this marriage, her happy in the marriage, I have to stop myself from doing this. But we had a conversation about it just recently. And I, and I said, you know, Laurie, I realize now that what you were doing was protective and it was coming from a good place and you were programmed to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that it reduced the probability that the likelihood that I was going to go and end up, you know, because what worries my wife used to, I don't know if it does anymore about me, is that she's like, she said, she'd say like this, you're not going to deliberately go and shack up with another woman. Yeah. But you're, you're just so dumb. You don't realize what they're doing <laughs> to you that you'll wake up next to them and you don't realize. So that's, that, that's funny. Lisa, so, says, Lisa will say the same thing to me. They all say that, yeah. She was, she'll be like, yeah, that, that, one, that woman's interested in me. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then all of a sudden, months later, I'm like, oh, my God, they really were interested in me. And she picked it up like that. Right, you know what right. I mean? They, that's it's like, the jealousy instinct, which is powerful. She's just like, yeah, so that girl's they trouble. Say, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about them. Right, right. Well, she's By the way, that's a, me, that's, a, that, that's a funny story. I, I, it I is hear funny, that. but it's like their, manip their, their ability to manipulate. Oh, yeah. into And, and there's, there's one example that I'm not going to bring up. but um, <laughs> Not because anything happened, but because, because one or two of the people might kind of identify if this goes mm -hmm. into the actual final yeah. uh, broadcast. But um, where, like, it, after I'm like, my God. She really had designs on me, and I just didn't see it. Yeah. And, and I was, and, and even Laurie didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Oh and, wow, really? See, Lisa's very perceptive. Well, not in, right away, but as she, as she, so, so I'm, I'm not going to name the country, but she, when she came on the on the second trip, she's like, my God, what the, what the fuck? Yeah. Is, you know? But um, the second thing that I wanted to say is, which I think is, so I don't, I don't think you have to believe in a higher power or God or anything like that, it, but. If, if I show up, and I don't do this particularly well, believing that the world was configured for me in order for, that, that what is happening, unfolding in front of me was put there for me for a reason. And I'm there actually to either experience joy or to learn from it. And if we assume that the way our spouses, if I assume the way my wife is showing up for me, it's not like, oh my God, how the hell am I supposed to put up with this? Instead, to take an attitude, an approach that says, Tell, you know, I need to discover why my spouse is showing up in this way for me, which is itching at me, annoying me, getting mm -hmm. me into fights, because there's something that God wants to show me. There's something that I need to learn. There's some new level of wisdom that I need to get at. So you can kind of like, it's kind of like everyday spirituality, every fight, every friction, everything becomes something to learn. And I actually really do believe that. Well, I, you know, it's um, Eckhart Tolle. I think it's Eckhart Tolle says it. He's like, it's, it, you know, I look forward to learning about this. I look forward to my next opportunity to get frustrated. I look at my next, you know, right. that, if you look at it that way, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Like last night, I was just like, I do not look forward to this. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're here at a show, and Juliet, and I noticed something, and I said, is everything okay? She says, everything's fine. I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> 
So me, like, like you said, <laughs> you hear abandon me, you run, and I have to know why is she mad at me. So of course I'm looking at her going, why are you mad? Why are you mad? Why are you mad? And it's she's like, fine. Hey. I'm not angry with you at all. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, after, but that's the thing. Like that's my thing. And she even said to me, hey, she's like, PG, if you just. It wasn't a big deal. And it, by the way, it wasn't a big deal. She's like, if you just let me relax a little bit, yeah, that's yeah. the hard part for me. So I think that what I learned about Laurie when, when that sort of like, Laurie, there's something wrong. Like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. Like, is that she's struggling with whether she wants to bring it up right now right. or not, whether it's worth bringing up or not. And so she's in a quandary one way or another. That's and, exactly where Lisa was. She's yeah. like, listen, it was a small thing. When she finally told me it was, I'm like, that's so stupid. She's like, exactly. So, so stop a second. I was like, you said that's so stupid. Because like, yeah, she already said it. She said to me. <laughs> I would not use so, that phraseology with my wife. You know, I just want you it's to funny. Know that. that one I can say. Really? I can't say the crazy stuff. If I, can't, <laughs> if I use the word crazy, we are, we are oh, close for business. That's it. But Have you I ever s- used the B word in your relationship? Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> I used it once. Did you really? Did you, once you want to see the scars? I think it took a week. <laughs> you, I will tell you this, though. I love it. I love it when she calls me an asshole. I don't know why. To me, I just look at it like... Yeah. I, I, just, I just like... I feel like it's, it's her way... Because I, I think I told you this. <clears throat> when she gets like insanely crazy and mad, I look at it now as her just letting it go and like getting it off her chest. So if she calls me, you're an asshole, and like, okay, good, like, let's get, get it, it out. out, let's get it out. And then I know it's like, and then five minutes later, she'll be, not five minutes later, but eventually she'll just be like, you're, you're just such a good fiance. I'm like, oh, thank you. No, kind of thing. Because I'm just like, it's not weird how just yesterday I was a, an asshole. And she's like, well, you were an asshole. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, but that's the thing. It's, it's like, to me, it's the ego of me. Watch your watch, guys. That still goes oh, on thanks. right now. And the ego of me that happened in the past was wondering, um, how do I win this battle? And only in the last year and a half, I realized it's not a battle to be won. And I really truly believed it was a battle to be won. Like, no, I am correct here. I am logically correct here. And now I just recently realized, okay, it's not about logically correct or not. It's just the feeling of it. And I, and the funny thing is, as, as black or white as I can be, as analytical as I can be, I do accept the feeling part. It's like well, a relief. She, she, there's, you know, there's this idea and I'm not, I don't, again, if I could, if you could create an extra five years of my life going back, I could have done the psychology degree. But there's this idea that um, we, we leave a part of ourselves behind in the shadow. We're not aware of that, but it is a part of us. And we, we select for somebody, and this is part of this Imago thing, we select for somebody that can reveal, so you're clearly very rational and logical. I like to be. But there's, there's a part of you that wants to be emotional. I'm and very intuitive. emotional too, though. So, but she brings up things yes. that have been left behind yeah. or that are not in your conscious mind. And so there's a kind of a spiritual thing that's going on in the relationship. And what's fascinating, you know, for the longest time until I was in my mid thirties, I just, you know, I'd date somebody for a couple of years that would end then a new person. And I thought I'd just go through my life like that. And what I realized was that I was getting to a certain point and then I was stepping back. And actually, the life actually starts when you step beyond that point mm-hmm. into the engagement that you're so clearly in, the engagement that I'm in. And, and like I said, I, I wouldn't want to fight with anybody else. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. I, I don't, um, even the year we were broken up, I always referred to her as, my, my gosh, she's like my wife. <laughs> and, that's the way I feel about it. Like, you know, even though, you know, of course, you sit there and say, I wonder what we'd like to be married to that person. I, like, I look at, you know, look at her and it's just like a, you know, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, we've had, we have prenup, right? We're, we're working the prenup and it's funny because um, the thing that frustrated me most of the prenup was I was yelling at her lawyer going, you realize like I was going to take care of her whether we were married or not. So when you tell me like I'm being greedy or selfish, I'm like, when I didn't need to be there for her, I was there. And then the funny part was about the prenup, you know what our sticking point about the prenup was? It wasn't that we get divorced. It was what happens if I die prematurely. That was the, that was the stick up. That was the hold up for Lisa and the prenup that I thought to myself, like, like, you know, most people would be like, well, what if this doesn't work out? How do I get as much money as possible? She accepted that day one. She's like, whatever you want for that one, I'll decide. It was what happens if you pass away prematurely? And because we have different ages in life, you know, your wife sounds yeah. a lot younger. She's 12 years younger. Yeah. Okay. She's 45. My fiance, my fiance is 59. So right. there's a big gap where she's not working. And if all of a sudden 10 years from now, I die unexpectedly, was she going to start working at 70? Yeah. No way. She's not going to do that. Yeah. And that was, I don't know. These are the things that are interesting for us going through it because I would have bet anything in the world that her lawyer, that she would have been stuck on, 
if we get divorced in year 12, what happens to me? No, she was a okay with that stuff. It was what happens if Paul dies prematurely for whatever reason. Yeah. Which I we thought did, was We didn't do a prenup. We just, uh, Were you well to do when you got married? Yeah. yeah, I guess so. Oh, really? But, uh, you know, look, it was, it was so, so, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to get into it. I Good just for said, you. Yeah. You were married for 20 plus years, right? 20 years this 20, year. 20 years this year. But, but we, something that, look, I think that there are a few things that you can't get over. In, in my experience, when I look around me at people whose marriages have not worked out, if you have any kind of serious, we're all, I, I, we're all on the spectrum of something, but <laughs> if you have a serious mental disorder mm-hmm. that you cannot come to grips with on your own, yeah. it creates an enormous challenge. Yes. Uh, so somebody who say bipolar, yeah. really, really hard. I mean, I think I have a ment. You know, we all have mental disorders. I don't. Ha- I have a. My- I have ADHD. My family accuses me of being autistic. Mm-hmm. I think if it's true, Sounds it's like very <laughs> mild. But uh, but you, the key is to to come to terms with it. There's there's a word, a Greek word called anognosia, and that anognosia is uh, awareness, no, lack of awareness of your own illness. Mm-hmm. And so with schizophrenia. If, if you are aware that you have schizophrenia, if you can understand that there are voices that you hear that other people don't hear, you can actually live a pretty normal life. Mm-hmm. But, um, so if, but if you have something, and especially undiagnosed, whether it's schizophrenia or, or, or bipolar disorder, I think it's very hard to stay married, something like that. Abuse of uh, substances, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very, very hard, and um, violence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If there's actual... if. You know, if and maybe you can get to. I think that some um, uh, abuse with words, if it's right, really extreme, right. and where the person is just like a suffering, then that they can it, it just gets so bad, the bank account is so empty that right. there's just no way of coming back from that. Which is sad because I, I I see some people in my life where they're not even aware of it. I think what's very sad about either physical violence or an abusive environment that is not maybe physical is that often that is the abusiveness is covering up pain from the past. Of course, oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Of course. Thank, thank of course. you, psychotherapist. Paul. No, That's but exactly yeah, I don't mean it like, like no, 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 <laughs> no, no. I love it. You're absolutely You know what? Right. That, was, that was terrible of me to say no, because no, it, good, it, it isn't I... so obvious, but now that I've learned so much about it, it's like, <laughs> No, you know, I love it. I, so so, so that it's very interesting. So for me. <laughs> that was mean of me. No, no. It was, yeah, but, but this is fascinating about different personalities. So when you were like, duh. I didn't mean it like. Yeah, no, but that motivates me. I'm like, oh, he's paying attention. Like, he's like, yeah, obvious. He's thinking ahead of me. And other people are like, oh, he was so mean to me. Like, no, I'm like, <laughs> it, 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 that, that, that gets me alive and my in, My intention of saying, of course, wasn't to say, duh. <laughs> it was to say that... Oh, please do it more. I like it. You know? Okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I don't want to... It's funny you say that because I, I hear that going, oh, my God, that is what that sounds like. But my, 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 my comment was from just... Years, I mean, I have 18 and a half years of therapy experience. 18 and a half years. I'm kind of envious because, you know, my, my full-time therapy stopped after 10 years, you know. Really? So, well, I... I you're retired. I just oh, you're full-time break. therapist. Yeah, therapist. Oh, mine, and by the way, mine's like 79, and, I'm, and he's got cancer now. I'm so sorry. But yeah, he's a great guy, and he's... Uh, in Cleveland? Yes, in Cleveland. He's does from he, New York, and he... Um, does he want another client? Just <laughs> <laughs> he's a great... You know, I'm in the market. Yeah. Well, my wife tells me I'm in the market for one <laughs> Listen, I, I tell people like, you know, um, I tell people the hardest part about therapy is feel free. You meet one, you don't like them, move on, find a different absolutely, one. Absolutely. So don't force trust it. your inner, you, the, you, the inner wise part of you to figure out what you need. Yeah. And if, and if you think you need to change, then change, you know, change, trust that. And that, that, that's, a, you know, one marital counselor that my wife and I visited. So we're having, you know, we've had plenty of fights. So this is in, in Zurich. I know this guy's in Stadelhofen, which is right next to where my office is. As so we go to visit him, and he's so bad, so bad, that we come out and we're like, my God, we kind of like it helped us to connect. But he was just like, he didn't have a clue. My wife, Laurie, can tell a better story about the details because I don't remember the details. But I think my point is that if you live in a place like New York City or London, I think there's a high concentration of really good therapists. I don't yeah. know what it's like in Cleveland. Probably LA is good. But there are, there are some really, really bad ones. And yeah. so if somebody's trying it out, don't assume that the one you've got is good. And if it's not working for you, then cut. You know? But it's just like investing. 
If you don't have a connection with them, it doesn't work for you. You got to move on. I don't care how talented you hear they are. If you can't get that connection with them where right. you're able to be open and honest with them about every aspect, you know, it's, you know, somebody very close to me is in therapy and they said, yeah, I didn't want to tell my therapist this. I said, you've got to be comfortable telling your therapist pretty much anything because yeah. if you don't have that connection. Yeah. And by the way, the therapist's seen it all, but oh, yeah. there's, a tr <laughs> there's a trust issue and, you know, who knows? It depends where it goes. I mean. Maybe they were committing crimes or something. I mean, there's ethical issues where if the therapist knows that crimes are being committed, mm -hmm. then they have yes. to maybe break that boundary. Yeah, but these were very simple things like, I want to break up with my spouse. And they're afraid to tell their therapist that. And I was like, that's what your therapist is there for, is that yeah. you say, hey, I'm not, I don't feel like I want to be in this relationship anymore. It's like, that's a... But what's fascinating about that is what that says to me is that person is so afraid of their own inner world. Yeah. That they're and, and maybe and they you hit that spot on. That's exactly yeah. what it was for them. I was afraid of the first. I remember feeling a little afraid of what I would find. It was a revelation to me to discover that there's this beautiful idea that we can solve any problem once we've got a light on it, you know. And what 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 the therapy does is it shines a light on something, and then and then we go to work and solve it. And to the realization that I can solve these things, I don't mm -hmm. have to be afraid of them. But my parents never get them as therapy. Oh no. My dad, my dad's a physician. He's like, oh, therapy's a bunch of shit. I'm like, okay, yeah. sounds good. No, and then there are the people who are like, oh, bring in the white coats. What, are you crazy or something? Yeah, absolutely, I'm crazy. And by the way, that's what I'm saying. Absolutely, I'm crazy. <laughs> the difference between you and me is I acknowledge that I'm crazy. <laughs> you're just living in this world where you think you're not crazy. And I, I think that in teams, whether it's with my family or with my work team, the, way, the, the, the greater degree we can acknowledge our own craziness and others can acknowledge and be accepted for their own craziness it's how you get really powerful teams working together, yeah. actually. So this was a wonderful. We yeah. have to go to dinner. This was <laughs> yeah. beyond we went what in directions I thought. Beyond what I thought we were going. Yeah, so, I was like, my God! And then we were close to ending, and then we we stopped. I literally it said on. that. I was like, oh, we got to end on this one. <laughs> so, Guy Spear, um, I hope you remember this one, and I wow. hope we have you on the show in the future when we have. How about this? We'll be a much bigger channel when you write that second book. Yes. We want to promote yes. you. I don't know. This was a wonderful yeah, conversation. Awesome. I wouldn't even be ending this I right now if it be, wasn't for... Even if the cameras weren't here, I'd have this conversation. Absolutely. You can, uh, you can get my wife and you can say, was it really that bad? Or can you yeah. tell us your side of the story? That's exactly <laughs> it. We need her to come in. And we I'll want to fully in Spanish. Her round table. I'll see if I can convince her. So the so education of Value with, Buster. With your ahead. wife. Oh, yes, with my wife. Oh, she would be great. Lisa would, <laughs> Lisa would absolutely love just... And by the way, I, it's funny. She tells me I reveal too much. I would love for her to come on and just talk about all this crazy... Because I don't... I'm not ashamed of anything that I... I shouldn't say I'm not ashamed of anything I don't do. But I, I'm very open about all the things that I've had happened to me in my life and things like that. And it's funny because she's like, you share too much, you share too much. <laughs> but when she says I'm crazy, like I don't get offended by that. I'm like, yeah. The, the, you should uh, say thank you. Yeah, exactly. The spectrum thing, she goes, she calls me Sheldon because of Big Bang Theory. She's like, you're like, Jay, I'm like, listen, we all are on the spectrum in some fashion. The Absolutely. question is just, you know, some are worse than others, so, but. I think what's been fascinating about this conversation is we started off and so I'm like, oh my God, he knows so much. And I like the things that he knows about. So I started with watches and then he got to psychotherapy. Yeah. We were on a whole different level. Uh -huh. I was like, oh, it's yeah. really fun, actually. Really, so really fun. Um, this is great. we're going to leave this now. And we expect you to buy that watch, Chrono 24, <laughs> if you need this. Come on, what are you going to take? You're 57. You got 30, 35 years left at most. Enjoy this watch for the next 35 years. And it's a Patek. Pass it down. Pass it down. <laughs> Mark Chapman, are you listening to that? <laughs> That's my CFO. <laughs> oh, don't listen he's to like, CFO. He's like, he's like, are you seriously not going to do that? You know? Do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Education and Value Investor, buy it. We don't get any money from it. Just please go buy it. You have to read it first. It's going to change your life. It really will change. It has to set the mindset, the mind frame, mindset for what you have to do to think about investing. It really was a phenomenal book, and I cannot speak. And this is not bullshit. I can't speak any more highly of that book. Well, yeah. thank you. That was very kind. Thank yeah, you, guys. No problem. Yeah, thank you. It's great to meet you both. Yeah, thank fantastic. you. Yeah.